Nova Scotia, the Canadian coastline, hundreds of deserted islands battered by deadly storm systems, gale force winds, and sub-zero temperatures. Throughout history, the waters off Nova Scotia have brought down an estimated 10,000 boats or more, forcing fishermen to abandon ship into frigid waters and a fight for their life. Stranded off the coast of a deserted island, a scenario two of America's top survival experts, military-trained woodsman Dave Canterbury and self-reliant naturalist Cody Lundin will experience firsthand. The mix that you've got here is the most deadly mix you can have. All over the world, boats go down, people die. January, off the coast of Nova Scotia, where the Titanic went down, that's hardcore. Dave and Cody are placing themselves in one of the most extreme environments on the planet to show what it takes to survive. We're gonna be trialed, we're gonna be tested, it's gonna be cold, it's gonna be wet, but the experience is a lesson for anyone who, God forbid, would ever be in this position. This is a dire situation. Ready or not, here it comes. back right now. We're just gonna have to overshoot this island a little bit to get the current to blow us into Let's it. Let's do that. Before becoming a skilled hunter and survivalist, Dave Canterbury spent eight years climbing the ranks to become an army sniper. He took that combat experience and turned it into some of the most respected survival videos on the web. You can still maintain your bearing and get where you're going. His philosophy, the elements are your enemy and only the strong will survive. My training is military. I'm trained to run a gun, get it done, you suck it up, you deal with it. This is gonna be a test of everything that I've got. Let's keep moving. The only thing we got for generating heat is us moving. Primitive living skills expert Cody Lundin doesn't just teach survival in the bush. He lives it. His home is far from civilization, and each year he takes students into the desert himself and survives right alongside of them. He's even written two books about the best ways to survive any situation. His mantra, adapt to the elements or die. I pay attention to Mother Nature because she's the boss. So I'm trying to think with her and not against her. We gotta head for those trees up there, Cody. Get this thing out of the wind. They each follow their own survival instincts. But working with someone else is a first for both. It's cold, man. I mean, it's freaking cold. First order of business, getting warm. This is probably a nine and a half to 10 out of 10 on the shittiest conditions you could possibly be in to try to survive. For Cody, adapting to his natural surroundings is a practice he's pushing to an extreme. By living the last two decades in only shorts and going barefoot, even here, he's choosing to only wear socks. I just need a few more minutes to regroup here a little bit. <laughs> Native Arctic cultures have adapted to the cold on a cellular level over generations. Cody is trying to do it in just one. I've been going barefoot for over 20 years. It trains the mitochondria, which are small organelles within the human cell that are the body's furnace. It makes them train harder and longer, which helps me produce more body heat on a day like today. I'm ready in 30 seconds. He chooses not to wear shoes and not to wear pants. It's bush hippie logic and mother nature stuff that I don't get. It's not a gimmick, it's a passion I have. I feel closer to the earth. My mitochondria can kick Dave's mitochondria's ass any day of the week. We made it to shore. Yeah, so far so good, right? Besides what natural resources the island provides, the only supplies on hand are a few basics from the burning vessel. I guess everything got wet. A knife, a plastic tarp, an emergency mylar blanket. This is good. And a single rescue flare. Oh, we've got an hour and a half worth of light. At the most, yeah. 
I want to get in those woods. The best defense from bitter coastal winds and potential hypothermia is to find protection inside the dense woods. Take the path of least resistance if we can find it here. Straight up through here, probably, Cody. We need to find some place better than this. This sucks. Man, I'm freezing my ass off, dude. As a survival instructor, this situation on the suck factor of death, it's got to be a 10. Let's get into this thicket here. Let's you break go in breaking here. through here? See what we can find? It's a combination of wet, raw, cold, and disorientation, and fear, and lack of supplies, and the, everything is sucking the body heat out of you. Very scary situation. There's some stuff. That sun's there. going down, buddy. We're just about to get screwed by Mother Nature. We've got rough about an hour day. left of light. Daylight is short in the Canadian winter. And after sundown, temperatures can drop 20 degrees in just a few hours. What I'm looking for is my nature shelter. I want something that's as ready-made as possible. Resorting to a natural cover, like thick overgrown trees or brush, saves valuable time. The other issue with this is we're starting to go downhill into a valley. I know, cold air sinks. Right. I don't like that. Look at this up here. See that? Yeah. Looks like a tree fell over or something like that. That's good. Let's check it out. Let's check that out. I don't know, brother. Got some water in there, man. There's water in there, but there's cover, and there's a safe place to build fire right out here. There is no perfect shelter spot. That's only in the survival books, right? Well, yeah, exactly. How many flares do we have? Just one? We got one. It's a one-shot deal. You got to have good dexterity in your hands to be able to make friction fire. And everything's wet right now out here anyway, so flare gun may be the best option. But all bets are on that flare gun. Yeah. We need to yeah. diversify tasks. I'll get the fire ready. OK, I'm going to clear out the snow and then get some bowels. All right, man. Let's get it done. I've got boots on. It's easy for me to roam this place real quick and find the dry wood to put on that fire with. A lot easier than it is for Cody. So his tasks are going to be right there by the camp so he can minimize his amount of walking through the snow in his wool socks. That way, I'm taking care of him. And it's probably going to dip down 20, 25 more degrees as that sun goes below the horizon. It's going to be cold tonight. Looking for good firewood in this place is pretty bad. It's tough. Flares contain potassium perchlorate, a powerful oxidizer, but it burns off in just a few seconds. Extremely flammable tinder is the only thing that can catch the short-lived flame. As you can tell by looking around here, this place is soaking wet. Dried moss is flammable and burns quickly, but may not catch long enough to create a fire. I'm going to put some in my pocket and use body heat to start to dry some of it out. OK, where's the target area for this flare gun? I think we're talking right here in this hole, right to the back of the fire bed right here. This flare, it's a wild card. We just need to rock and roll and see what happens. OK, you got the target area, man? I got it, OK, Cody. let's rock and you roll. Ready? I'll run down there. I'm ready to run down there. When Dave sets off the flare, they have seconds to ignite their tinder before the flame burns out. All right, brother, fire in the hole. Oh, <laughs> Cody, damn thing didn't go anywhere. Get some more small stuff. It's too wet. Yeah, it's not dry enough. Too wet, too wet, too wet. No, I can't see what I'm doing because of the smoke. That old man's beard in there, maybe. Yeah, here, let me get this. You got it? It's too wet. Come on. Hey, it's too wet back in there. Come on. That's what happened. All right, Cody, blow her to life, baby. Getting that fire started is very much like giving a human body CPR. Cody's in there just going at it and going at it and going at it, and he just wasn't giving up, and he wasn't letting it go until he got that fire going. Watch out. I'm going to keep piling the smaller tinder on there as you're putting the bigger stuff on, man. There's only three ways that you can heat your body. You can have clothes on, you can eat food, or you can build fire. Fire is like God in a situation like this. So how's your feet, man? Great. Why? 
I got some serious concerns about the fact that you're like half naked in the, in the wilderness. I'm a common sense kind of guy. I have a hard time buying into all this nature, mother earth, bush hippie crap. I do it as a personal challenge. I do it to feel more connected to the planet. I do it because hundreds of thousands of other people before me could and did. I do it because I can. It makes no sense to me. Why would you even think about coming out here with no shoes on in this kind of weather? Are you going to be able to handle this? This is what I do, man. This is the way I live my life. If it becomes a problem for me, it's going to piss me off, man. And we're going to have words about it. Coming up, Cody's survival tactics fracture the team. I'd offer you my pants and boots, but I know you'd turn it down. I'm going to so. turn it down. Yeah, you know that. Pushing Dave to test his own limits. Why would you even think about coming out here with no shoes on in this kind of weather, especially in the snow in the northern Atlantic in January in Nova Scotia? Are you out of your mind? This is what I do, man. This is the way I live my life. This is called acclimatization. I love your boots, but I don't need your boots, and I prove that with my lifestyle. Let me give you a foot physiology 101. If I take a sweaty foot and stuff it into a boot and I lace it up too tight to impede the circulatory system and I crush my insulation by standing on it, I'm screwed. That's why most people have frost nip or frostbite to their toes. Cody's practice may have merit. A scientific study compared the feet of modern humans to those of 2,000-year-old skeletons and concluded that people had healthier feet before shoes were invented. But for the normal person, it's insane. Correct. I mean, we got to get that straight now. I do not recommend that people do what I do. I don't feel I need to prove myself to Dave. I just need to follow my heart and do what I do. If it works, it works, you know? If it doesn't work, I'll change. Cody explained his mumbo jumbo and science to me as far as why he doesn't wear shoes, and I'm still not buying into it. But he's lasted out the day so far, so we'll see how he works out. cast guys today it's pretty windy and it's quite a bit colder than it was yesterday so we're gonna have to fight that today i think we need to make a game plan for today maybe i can soup this shelter area up make this perform a little bit better i'd like to investigate that beach for a signal fire area we'll divide and conquer this whole thing man that's all we can do the most important skill in wilderness survival working with what you've got. You know, as I'm walking through here, there's several things that I'm looking for. I'm looking for shell, I'm looking for stone. All of those things can make tools, all of those things can make things that we can utilize. You're a constant scavenger. You know, I'm gonna be like a junkyard dog. Obviously, we're by the ocean, there's some sea life here. Dead mollusks, like clams and mussels, are likely to be infected with bacteria. It smells like crap. But a good survivalist can find a use for anything. I can use that later on for bait, carry that out, and make my traps. Any predators that are around are going to be attracted by this. I'm a self-preservation type guy. You know, I'm not going to walk through here and not look for usable resources. But my main goal out here is to get a signal fire built. A signal fire may be a shipwreck survivor's only chance at rescue. But with open water surrounding the island, the fire needs to catch attention from air and sea. OK. This is a perfect spot for my signal fire. I got a wide open shipping lane right here. I got lots of resources over here. And this is the highest point out here for that. This is the spot. I got to go get some dry wood. A burning ember will need to be transferred from camp. But sparking this signal fire will require something more combustible than dry logs. Hey, that's exactly what I'm looking for right there. This is a birch bark tree. This stuff goes up in flames like gasoline. It has a lot of oils in it. I'm going to need a good, fresh piece of this. It's easier for me to just cut it right off the tree, fresh and live, and not wait for it to peel off itself eventually. Cody would not like this, but it'll be a bigger piece. Other stuff is the best fire tender you can possibly find in boreal forest areas like this. Dissipating clouds will release the warm ground level air, which will drop temperatures even more once the sun sets. 
Dave's doing his thing and I'm doing my thing. My thing is to make this a better place to be. I want to revamp this shelter using basic physics and make it 10 times more efficient. If I can make this shelter 75, 80 degrees and use one tenth of the wood, that's a huge survival savings. So I'm gonna take that plastic that I got from the boat and try to make a bubble like a greenhouse here. The long wave radiation from the fire will go through the plastic and heat up the inside of this lean-to. And as I do that, I'll have a space blanket, that mylar shiny blanket on the underside of this, which will reflect the long wave radiation onto us, and it'll be trapped within a bubble of plastic. Developed by NASA, aluminized mylar reflects up to 97% of solar radiation. It's used to protect the International Space Station from the sun. I need to somehow figure out how to put a space blanket behind me, and I'm not sure how to do that. I know what I want to do, I just don't know how to do it yet. The improved shelter will use less firewood and stay warmer, if it works. You know, even opening up this damn space blanket, it's like, I mean, where do they hire these people to fold this thing? I mean, look at how many folds are in this thing. Oh, what am I gonna do? Now, I'm trying to find the exact location we came in on the raft so that I can scavenge off of that raft any usable equipment that we've got left on. It's basic survival code to never destroy a means of escape. I wanna leave this raft as totally intact as I can right now. But what's attached to it can be even more useful. There are some baffles on the bottom of this boat that we can definitely use for containers. You know, there's a lot of rope on here. I'm gonna take all this rope with me. Um, I can actually carve one into this broken paddle off and make it into a point and fire harden it. And I can spear a raccoon, a skunk, a possum. You know, there's a lot of animals out here, small woodland type animals that are edible animals. The two most important things that people need to understand in a situation like this, you have to maintain body's core temperature and hydration. Without either one of those, you will die. Got a pond here. It's got cattails growing everywhere. That's a good sign that this water's fresh. Snow is 90% air and 10% water. Ice is 90% water and 10% air. That's why I want ice. I'm just sliding around. This ain't safe. Getting into some good stuff here. I see bubbles right here. I want to make sure there's no salt in it. It doesn't taste like salt at all. It tastes better than bottled water. How you been, man? Been doing. What you got in the bag? Where'd you get the bag? Got the bag off of the uh, boat there. I cut the ballast off the bottom, put some ice in there. Sweet. Talk to me about this shelter, man. I mean, you got a Lakota sweat lodge, bush hippie party house going on in here. Let's explain it's this a, to it's me. It's a fun house that's gonna use like maybe one eighth of the wood. It is what it is, man. I mean, I don't understand why anybody would drape plastic over their shelter in front of their fire. You know, if your fire gets too big, Obviously, it's gonna melt that thing away. It's just not the way that I'm used to doing things. You've gotta come all the way out of that shelter now to put wood on the fire. Right. So is that a shift to shift shelter? Or two people gonna snooze in there we and one guy's both. just gonna have to get up? No, both. And you're gonna to be toasty in there, okay? I don't know if you quite read between the lines about what I really did. There was some hardcore physics that were going on there. I'll see you in a bit then. I'd offer you my pants and boots, but I know you'd turn it down. I'm gonna so. turn it down, yeah, you know that, okay. I'm gonna liberate Dave's mind tonight. When he goes in that shelter, I'm gonna put too much wood on it, and I'm gonna burn his shorts off his body. Next. I think that's probably gonna burn long enough to get me there and back. Dave breaks survival code. If someone on one of my courses wanted to do something like this, I'd have zero tolerance, zero. Threatening to leave him in the dark. I'm running out of time, and I got a whole ass.
calories are hard to come by in a situation like this. And this is a big calorie game. Whether it's the wood on the fire or the food in the body, it's still fuel. In extreme cases of malnutrition, the body begins a process called catabolysis and breaks down its own fat and muscle tissue to stay alive. I would like to check out the coastline and see if I can get some slow moving protein. Maybe there's some mussels, maybe there's clams, maybe there's crabs. So right off the bat, here's what I'm looking for. This little place here, there's a breathing hole here, there's one here, and I'm gonna just dig, it's low tide, so the water's out. Digging sticks were used cross-culturally for thousands of years, so this simple stick doesn't require any energy to make it, but look how more efficient it is than my hands. Sometimes these clams can be fairly deep. Just because there's an indicator doesn't mean there's supper there. Here's what we're after. There's a live clam. To me, these are easy calories to catch. All you need to do is gather them. This can be eaten raw, just as is. We're out of there. Comes in its own salt brine. This is rockweed. It is edible. It's not pizza, for sure, but it's something to eat. I happen to know this rockweed, but if I don't know what it is, I don't eat it, because if you're sick out here, it compounds the problem incredibly. Like a hunting gathering person, I'm grazing as I'm going and just eating on the fly. Calories, these calories don't run. These are periwinkles. They're just literally all over this little beach. Even though a single periwinkle has minimal meat, the sedentary snails form in dense clusters along shorelines. It's all a calorie game. When you bring back something, you've made that energy you've spent worth it. Yeah! I've seen plenty of tracks. There's some stuff out here. Dave's survival strategy stands in opposition to Cody's gatherer philosophy. I hunt all seasons. I hunt all types of game. I hunt with all types of weapons, from primitive weapons to modern weapons to homemade fashioned weapons. I have to do what I have to do to fight Mother Nature because Mother Nature's unforgiving. She doesn't let you survive. If you just laid here half naked like Cody does, you don't survive. Burning through calories to track game is a gamble. If it takes more energy to find food than it provides, it's a losing one. Okay, now we've got a set of tracks right here. We know what animals are in this area. There's probably porcupines, we know there's squirrels. So we can, by process of elimination, we can tell these are small tracks. Most likely, this is a squirrel. But the good thing about this is it's telling us there's small game in this area. I want to do some trapping. I want to find something to bring back to the table for Cody. Okay. This is a good spot right here for our deadfall. I can see some tracks back in here. I know that there's squirrel in here, I know there's rabbits, I know there's raccoon in here. You know, this is a real simplistic trap. I have these nasty old clams in my back pocket. We'll just break that nasty thing up and put them on the end of this skewer for bait. Oh yeah, put my bait stick in here, back my deadfall up in there. A deadfall trap consists of a heavy log and a baited trigger. The idea is to get that thing just barely pivoting on this trap. The log needs to be five times the weight of the prey to work. And all he has to do is move it. It's not gonna kill a 20 pound raccoon, but it will kill a small weasel, a marten, a squirrel, something like that that comes in here just nibbling around. It's winter, the animals right now are scavenging for food everywhere. I gotta set at least six to eight more if it's gonna produce anything for us in the next few days for me. Got some goodies, Dave. Got some fresh, wonderful, Bounty of the sea. She got in there, man. Periwinkles and clams. You know, I've never been much on seafood. I gotta tell you that, Cody. Just don't really look at it too close. Just eat it.
but it's definitely proteins. These are like, you know, organic clams. I mean, how much would you pay for organic clams? Zero. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. I think eating periwinkles and clams sucks. I can't stand the taste of that stuff, but it's food, it's protein. <laughs> oh, he ain't coming out of there. Dude, I think he jumped out of his shell. He's not in there. I'm poking him, he's not coming out. Knock, knock. <laughs> he's saying the lights are on, but nobody's home. Wow, dude, there's like zero freaking meat there. OK. That's like chewing on gristle. <laughs> I can deal with that. <laughs> Give me about 150 periwinkles, and you can have your clams. Well, if I had to survive on these, I'd be dead in a week. What you got? You know, those clams were OK, and the periwinkles were OK, but I like meat that comes from four-legged hairy animals. That's what I want to eat. And I figured I think I can make a torch by rolling up some of this birch bark into a real tight ball and shove it onto my paddle like this. And you just have to go check a couple of traps that aren't too far away. What if you take a whipper over a log or something? I'll scream. Know? I'll squeal. You'll know it. Walking into the dense woods alone and at night breaks a survival team's cardinal rule. If someone on one of my courses wanted to do something like this, I'd have zero tolerance. It would not be done. Zero. So you would choose to risk your safety, and including my ass, walking out in the darkness in Nova Scotia to check your traps? Well, I, I consider the risk to be worth it. You know, it's your call. I'll be eating my words, maybe literally, if you come back with something in the trap. So I'm just going to leave it alone. Going out into the darkness with an improvised birch bark torch in a survival situation is not the best option. And Dave knows that. Well, I'm going to get this torch done. I think that's probably going to burn long enough to get me there and back. Burn time on one of these is probably six or seven minutes if you're lucky. All right, man, I'm taking off. If Dave goes out tonight and brings food home, then he's going to want me to eat all of my socks, but I'm sticking to my guns. I'm going to be in a little bit of a hurry now. My partner thinks this is hurting the tribe, but my partner walks around in bare freaking feet in 10 degree weather. That's hurting the tribe. I'm running out of time, and I got a whole ass. It's nighttime in the bitter cold of Nova Scotia. In these woods, wandering out in the dark with a fast-burning torch is a risk and goes against survival code. OK, here's my trap. Nothing's in it. I got a whole ass back. If someone went out who didn't need to at night in a wintertime survival situation and got themselves injured, that's called the gene pool at work. And better that they not breed. Disorientation in the wilderness can lead to a psychological condition called wood shock. I'm going to be in a little bit of a hurry now. Confusion and vertigo overload the brain, causing panic. Now I'm running out of time. Where even an experienced survivalist can make simple and deadly mistakes. All right. I made it, man. You did make it. OK, where's the booty? You got any food? There is no booty. The trap was empty. The torches just sat there smoldering and smoldering and smoldering. I thought it was going to go out. They don't mean to sound like the, you know, the little woman here at home, but that was a bad call. I hope that's just one little experiment, you know, that this is not a nightly occurrence. They told me, yes, I can make a torch. Yes, I can sustain it for a few minutes if I need to. And it's, it's a good lesson learned. You're trying to prove something to yourself every day by being out here with very little clothing on. So there's a give and take there, I think. To me, this is not taking a chance. This is who I am. This is how I live my life. I mean, it's snowing now. I wonder if it's going to snow all night. It's been a long day. I'm about yeah. wore out. How about you? Yeah, I'm tired. I'm way excited to check out the super shelter because I know I'm going to be cozy, comfy, use very minimal wood, dry some of this stuff out, and I won't even have to snuggle with Dave tonight. So I'm sure he'll be happy about that. So what do you think? How much more wood is it going to take to get that shelter warmed it's up? It's warm, man. You'll be comfortable, Dave, or your money back. Holy cow. Oh, it's toasty in here. See, I can't even get close this to that. This thing's like a sweat lodge, man. Yeah, exactly. 
explain this shelter to me. What's happening now with the fire is that long wave radiation is coming through the plastic and it's being reflected from this mylar blanket onto where we are right now and it's being trapped. So essentially we're in a greenhouse trapping that long wave radiation, but it's bumping it up because it's being reflected back down to where we are. The shelter reaches a comfortable 70 degrees despite 31 degree temperatures outside. I gotta say, I'm more than impressed. Cody. This is probably the warmest winter shelter I've ever been in in my life. It's physics. Yeah. Okay, Dave. Night, John boy. <laughs> Night. <laughs> that was the call of the wild for you. <laughs> it's early morning. Temperatures are continuing to dip more than 10 degrees since yesterday, and fresh snow blankets the island. Hey, how you doing this morning? A little bit whipped. You know, food's food in a survival situation, but I've got to get some four-legged furry critters, man. So I'm going to go out and scout around, do some hunting. Right. Um, is there any way that you could get that signal fire lit? Yeah, I'll light it. I'll get my stuff together, and I'm going to head out in just a second. OK. Cody's out there hunting periwinkles and snails and stuff. I want to bring back some big meat sustenance for some fat and some protein. OK, look up here now. This is the sure sign that a porcupine's been in this area. This tree's been ringed out at the top. Porcupine love to eat pine bark in the wintertime. They feed on that stuff voraciously. Porcupines are slow-moving animals. But because they spend much of their time in trees, they are difficult to catch. OK, this is bad. It is bleeding some sap, so it hasn't been long ago. Problem is, it snowed so much right here, the tracks are covered. So we're just gonna have to move on, see if we can find some true tracks. Porcupines ravages that one over there, heavy duty. I can stick him with this point, but he's not gonna die immediately that way. Not a porcupine because they're too thick skinned, they got too much hair. The best thing I can do is just a blunt force trauma. If I can catch him on the ground, one swift crack behind the neck will kill him instantly. And that's the most humane way to do it. If there's small game I'm tracking, I like to get as close to the ground as I can get, because on a flat level, it's easier to see movement. I just saw a porcupine run through here. I'm pretty sure it was a porcupine. I'm killing an animal, my first priority is a clean, humane kill. One shot, blunt force trauma, behind the neck, crack the spine, usually kills him immediately. And then I'm gonna go in, cut the animal's head off to make sure he doesn't suffer at all. And that's my only goal when it comes to killing an animal. Hopefully, Cody's out here lighting our signal fire, and when he gets back, I'll have a hot meal waiting on him, and it means everything to our morale. After food, water, and shelter, the ultimate survival priority is an escape route. I'm going to go to light a signal fire. So this is the only fire we have on the island, so I'm transferring the fire by lighting this cattail head. 
Essentially, this is compressed fuel. This pipe might burn for hour, hour and 15 minutes in a windless condition. The same amount of fuel, if I busted up the cattail, would burn within seconds. So because the oxygen is limited, it burns slow, like a punk. Just like this fire has cooked clams and provided warmth for us and melted snow for water, it's now going to signal for rescue. There's a little bit of concern in my mind right now as far as, you know, all the prickles on this dude. So I'm going to try to avoid the back and just cut it right up the front. I'm trying to stay just underneath the skin with this. I don't want to break that into that gut cavity because if I end up splitting the gut at all, it can taint the meat, and I don't want that. E. coli bacteria, which lives in the intestines of all warm-blooded animals, can cause serious, even fatal, food poisoning. See that hole right there? That's going to lead to the gut cavity. That's what I was looking for. This is a jewel right here. That is the heart of that dude right there. Just like your heart, just like my heart. This is where that animal spirit lives. That's the real deal, connection with the animal. Inuit cultures rely on organ meats, which are much higher in vital nutrients to survive in Arctic climates that lack fruits and vegetables. Got some thick hide and a lot of fat on them. You can actually burn that fat just like a fat lamp. Like with an oyster shell, you can fill that with tallow, make yourself like a seaweed or an old man's beard, piece of cordage for a wick and lay that in there, light it on fire and it would burn for maybe two hours. Animal fat can also be used for waterproofing or as a lubricant, but it's put to the best use when it's ingested. Animal fat is what you have to have. If you don't have fat, sooner or later, you will die. There's a lot of meat on here, which means a lot of calories, a lot of fat, a lot of protein, and a happy hippie when he comes back. Rescue in a survival situation is never a guarantee. I mean, ask any dead person. That's a fact. Always, always, always actively promote search and rescue. As far as settling for rescue, you want contrast and movement. So there's not a whole lot of contrast if we did white smoke on this sky, but there's contrast against those spruce in the background. The signal fire's lit, so my spirits are up, but then also, again, this is just the beginning of hauling firewood out here. There's only one hour of daylight left. Once the sun sets, Cody will have to return to camp, abandoning the fire until morning. At least the view's good, right? It's real pretty, but it's just a whole lot of water, you know, with no one on it. Dual survivals, art of self-reliance. This is a balsam fir tree, and it has these resinous nodules on here. And this resin is highly combustible, and it can be used as a natural first aid antiseptic. Indigenous cultures also use the balsam resin as a topical painkiller. You can make self-adherent bandage with some old man's beard, take some of this, and wrap it up, and it's good to go. With night approaching on the island, temperatures threaten to drop below zero. Ahoy. Hey. There are two reasons I'm glad you're back. What's the second one? <laughs> the first one's obvious, right? What? <laughs> the fire suck and wind because we were gone too long. And yeah. You have fire material. Yeah. The second one is I have some meat. What did you get? Porcupine. You're kidding me. Come check it out. How oh. in the hell did you do that? Paddle. Wow. Caught him in an opening. Oh, that's great. All right, man. Now we got some meat, we got some protein, we got some fat. We're good. That's great. Congratulations, Dave. Thanks, man. Let's cook it. I saved you half the heart. Half the heart? Yeah. Well, you probably ate it raw, right? Oh, yeah. 
Oh, hell no. I'm going to cook mine. <laughs> OK, man. It smells really good, Dave. Really good. As long as it tastes better than the clams I had last night, I'll be happy. I think that's a given. I'm going to consider that you like your heart well done. <laughs> I do like a well done heart. <laughs> Looks like it's just about cooked. Thank you. That's quite an honor. Porcupine heart. You never kill something and chuck it and just eat the meat. You eat the meat, you eat the fat, you eat whatever organs you can. You save the entrails for bait, the bones for tools. That's intense, man. Thanks for getting this. Nothing goes to waste on that animal. That's the right, responsible, sane way, in my opinion, to kill something. You honor it and you use it. You ever had porcupine before? No, I sure haven't, man. How about you? I think I had a roadkill once. How was it? Well, it sure wasn't this fresh. How does this compare to clams? <laughs> Ask me how much I'd pay for this. <laughs> <laughs> how much would you pay for organic porcupine? Oh, uh, right now? Everything I have. <laughs> <laughs> organic free range spruce fed porcupine. <laughs> You have to do whatever you need to do to keep yourself calm. And sometimes you just have to stop and think, evaluate your situation, evaluate your resources. Maintaining a calm attitude and good decision making is what leads to the difference between survival and death sometimes. Cody and Dave have been living out a scenario, an experience to prove survival is about the right state of mind. Survival psychology is everything. The will to live is everything. But the ultimate goal of any survival situation is to stay alive long enough to get rescued. Coast Guard! But for a survivor whose fate is in actual peril, there are still rules to follow. Since the Canadian Coast Guard patrols more than three million miles of ocean, even if you can see them, they may not see you. I'm putting this black rubber off our raft, I cut it off earlier. This will put some black smoke in the air, attract better attention to just the bows. Black smoke. It's going to contrast against the gray sky better. It's best to make a focal point. Now we just got to get this boat in here and get off this island. And stay put for the rescue. Yeah, I see him there. I think the goal in any survival situation, number one, is to adapt to the situation. I always tell my students, improvise, adapt, and overcome. You know, and I think that's it's a very important three things. I try to pay attention to Mother Nature. I realize that she's the boss. She's neither for you nor against you. She just is. And you try to adapt to her to survive. What we did together here, it was beautiful. It worked out perfect for us. And that's what it's all about. Right. Good job, man. All right, man, that's great. How do we get the hell out of here? Can definitely use the ride. In the heart of Southeast Asia, lies the Lao People's Democratic Republic. This landlocked country is a landscape of dense jungle and rugged mountain terrain. An untamed ecosystem attracting backpackers and adventure tourists from around the globe. But here, a simple wrong turn can transform a day hike into a living nightmare. where survival experts Dave Canterbury and Cody Lundin are going to test their limits. Because of this terrain, the huge, dense vegetation, you could get lost turning around in a place like this. The average backpacker that comes to an area like this is going to be in trouble right off the bat. They haven't done the research. They haven't had the training. Their objective, to show that getting lost in the dense jungle doesn't mean certain death. You have things that bite, things that sting, things that poke and rip, dehydration, oppressive heat, humidity that doesn't let the sweat evaporate from your body, and then it goes from bad to worse. You're in a dense jungle surrounded by spiders, torrential rains, all kinds of predators. You come out here and you're uneducated and you're unprepared, you're going to die.
so thick in here you can't even get through here hardly. Dave Canterbury, an eight-year Army veteran and special response team instructor, has been in the jungle before, but never unequipped and without support. Most of the time that I've spent in the jungles thus far has been in Central America when I was in the military. Everything out here is against you as far as Mother Nature goes, and you have to combat that all the time with what you have in your head. His partner, Cody Lundin, has been a survivalist for decades, teaching students how to stay alive by adapting to their surroundings. But conquering this extreme terrain will test even his arsenal of survival skills. We have a serious challenge ahead of us. You know, with the boom of ecotourism, there's a bunch of trippy-dippy hippies out here now with their backpacks. So with that kind of tree-hugging mentality comes the person out here with Jack for knowledge and less in their backpack, and that's a setup for disaster. All Cody and Dave have are a couple of cutting tools and a few random supplies that a tourist might have in their backpack. A camera, a roll of condoms. Hey. Who the hell was set. this day hiker? I man? have no clue. Pretty good resource, though, actually. A lot of things you can do with a condom. We could hold water with that if we needed to. And a pack of smokes. Because everything's here. Yeah, we're good. For our little jungle trip. <laughs> OK, well. Their first step, choosing a direction. If I want to go down. If we go down, yeah. Water's going to go to the low spot. Maybe we can follow the river to the village, and I don't know if that's going to cut it out here. But this sure doesn't cut it here, because I can't see anything. Yeah, I okay. agree. In any survival situation, people can panic. You're gonna to wanna to run around like a chicken with your head cut off, but in a jungle environment where it's so thick, I wanna keep working down to find water. Rain travels downhill, the water's gonna be downhill. Go downhill as far as you can till you can find a river. A river is practically a roadmap to civilization. But in this harsh environment, finding one could take hours of trekking. Ow! Watch this log, Cody. Yep. And Cody doesn't wear shoes. Cody worries me with the bare feet in a jungle environment. That hippie attitude just wears me out. People think I'm an idiot by going barefoot. A little bit insane, a little bit half off, but I've been going barefoot for over 20 years. Going barefoot is part of his indigenous survival strategy. Walking barefoot out here is not comfortable, but frankly, it's what most of the world population did and still does. The Lao people may have gone barefoot for centuries, but it's Cody's first time in this jungle. What I'm worried about out here are mostly mechanical injury, like the bamboo that all of a sudden goes through my foot. Getting injured in this scenario is a constant threat to survival. Here, if you can't walk, you can't walk out. In this terrain, it's incredibly rough. You know, there's the steep angle. Some of the pitches have to be more than, more than 80 degrees. They're damn near vertical. Nothing like trying to do this being peppered with biting ants. Oh. Right. Yeah. You OK? <laughs> the only way to make headway in thick jungle is to literally carve your own path. When you're bushwhacking, you have to stay down low. You're not really trying to cut everything down. You're just trying to move it out of your way so that you can see what's going on. The lower you stay to the ground and the more noise you make, the less chance you're going to have a run into reptiles out here. It's starting to open up a little bit. I think I hear some water over here, man. Off to the right. Oh, yeah, we got water, Cody. Oh, nice. We got nice. water. Look at this, brother. Water may be the most valued resource when hiking through the humid jungle, Man. where the body can lose two quarts in just an hour. Water is obviously the biggest factor out here. It's so humid, and yet it's so hot that you can dehydrate out here quickly. But drinking unfiltered river water can be just as dangerous as dehydration. What do you think, man? I'm thinking maybe we take a couple of cigarette filters, and I can drink some of this water. I mean, it's not going to be the safest thing in the world. It's not something I would recommend it. Everybody do, you know, but. Are you going to trust that cigarette filter with this water? I'm going to trust it enough to drink a small amount of it. Well, you know, it's not the stuff you can see that gets you sick, man. I understand that. I'm not going to drink a gallon. Hit yeah, but Dave, sick. if you take the hit, I take the hit. You know how that works. It looks clean, but we're not talking about looks, because the pathogens that get you sick are teensy, tiny, little, small things that can't be seen with the naked eye. I'm going to go over here and work on this filter. You check out what's right around here. But let me have that pack so I can take those filters with me. 
using a cigarette filter to drink unsanitized water is a risk, one that Cody's not willing to take. Oh, look at this. Check this out. But he's got an alternative way to deal with dehydration. This is the Lao red ant. This is its nest. What an indigenous people here did, they took these ants, they rubbed them, and they used them as a smelling salt. And if they were feeling a little bit woozy or dehydrated, woo, that has a pretty intense smell. It's almost like a super shot of vinegar potato chips, definitely. And of course, they're edible, too. You don't need to cook them. And they have that kind of vinegary taste. Whoa. And they're freaking out now. Ow! They do bite, and they will sting. So you got to kind of get them before they get you, so to speak. Look at them jump and track my finger. They're wondering who the big hippie is that just ripped up their home, which they'll mend. But at a certain time of year, this will be full of eggs, and they can be eaten raw or literally scrambled, like scrambled eggs. So I'll leave the loud red ants alone, let them get back to their thing, because I got stuff to do. Stuff up here, man. This is a this is a form of river cane. It's very similar to bamboo. So if I cut this off between here, then I have a hollow tube. In effect, I have a drinking straw. This kind of stuff makes excellent spears for fishing. It makes great shafts for arrows and things like that as well. Okay, there we go. Now I'm going to take a couple of these cigarette filters off of here, and I'm just going to break the whole filter off and leave the paper on it. But I'm going to save this. I don't want to throw this away because we can use this tobacco for an antiseptic. If you get a bug bite or something like that, you can put this on any kind of a wound or cut, and it'll work real well for that. And now I'm going to put them in there back to back, just like that. I'm going to take this down get myself a drink. There's four main families of waterborne pathogens that make you want to barf up a lung and fill your pants with crap. Viruses, protozoa, bacteria, and parasites, and they are not disinfected or killed from that cigarette lazy ass butt filter. Not bad, we'll see. So I wouldn't recommend it to the world or anything, but if I don't get sick in 20 minutes, then we'll know, right? Well. Or an hour or two or tonight. Or a few days. <laughs> or, well, yeah, it's, well, it's just... hopefully we'll be out of here by then, right? Yeah. Dysentery symptoms. Vomiting, diarrhea, and a fever can take up to three days to develop. Without immediate medical care, they can also be fatal. What do you think? But well, we're losing light. Yeah, we're so gonna run we, out of daylight. Uh, prioritize and let's find a safe place. Well, if we can make a fire, we can boil it, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay. All downstreams lead to the ocean sooner or later, and anywhere around water is going to be the most chance of finding civilization. You're not going to find civilization just haphazardly walking through the jungle out here. Boo! There's a hole. This is really dangerous through here, so we got to really be careful of that because there's all these pots and pools right here, all have cracks and crevices that go underground, so you got to be really careful not to fall in them too, because you have no idea how far you're going to fall when you go in them, or if you're going to be able to get back up for that matter. Look at this. We got. Wow, that looks like it's gonna. Is that dropping off there? It looks like it's gonna drop off real hard. We got a problem here, Cody. We're not. Uh, I mean, we gotta get down, and yeah. there's no way to get down. It's safe. Coming up, dividing labor puts Cody and Dave at odds with each other. Cody's back at camp, you know, playing Susie Homemaker Hippie Guy. I'm going to be out here getting us some food. But working as a team is the only way they'll get through miles of Lao River Rapids. Well, I come from river country, so. I just don't want to die. It's survival basics. Streams lead to civilization and can mean the difference between staying lost and getting out alive. We got a problem here, Cody. But this one's a dead end. In a true situation, you do not take chances of breaking a leg. Oh, this is a no-go. Climbing over precarious boulders and cliffs goes against the best survival strategy. Unbelievable. We're going to have to traverse up over the jungle to get a high point to see where we can get down. The next option is to go back into the jungle and seek out a better vantage point. 
But as night falls, survival code dictates a new priority, finding shelter. We're obviously not spending the night here, next to the waterfall. Uh, we ain't that, gonna go that, that way sucks. Let's, let's yeah. just hope this side pans out. Okay, let's do it. We're losing light. We've got probably two hours worth of light left. The creepy crawlers come out at night. I don't want to screw around and not have a, a base camp. We're not going to be walking until dark is the bottom line. Jungle shelters should be raised off the ground, away from poisonous insects, and have fire nearby to ward off large predators. Look at this up here. Let's check that out. But in an emergency situation, finding anything that's covered will have to do. Whoa. Let me just peel down in there a little bit. It's dry. So you want to commit to this? I don't know, brother. I'm not entirely happy with the location, but we will have shelter from potential rain. Taking advantage of opportunities like this in a survival situation is huge. Here we have this dome shelter with padding that's dry that's created boom, just like that courtesy of Mother Nature. So we don't have to spend the calories. We can plan for tomorrow. Hydrate, get some food, get direction. It's a huge bonus to find this. We've got a place that we can shelter up for the night. Tomorrow, we're going to put some calories in our body and move on. In just a few hours, the humid air will heat up to over 90 degrees. The best defense against the jungle's most pervasive threat is hydration. Well, I can go get water and something to boil water in if you can work on a little bit of food, something, just something to put some calories in our body. So uh, I'll meet you back here and, you know. Yep, sounds good, man. You need to be prepared to survive. Preparedness is always the key. Dave returns to the nearby river for the number one jungle survival priority, water. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take a condom that we had out of this pack. This condom will hold almost a liter of water. The trick to this is let the weight of this water inflate the condom. Just like that. I'm going to tie this off. Hopefully, we're going to get fire. We can boil this water. We're out of here. Cody's jungle survival philosophy, adapt to mother nature and she will provide. Resourcefulness and adaptation are keys to survival. All I see when I look around here is opportunity. So there's kind of what I'm looking for right there. It's a wild banana palm. Southeast Asia is the native home of the banana, making them plentiful in this region. Wow. I'm killing the plant to do this, but there's several things we'll do with this banana palm. If I cut this, Cut it down as low as I can go, and then scoop it out. And this stalk itself, it'll fill with water. Look at that. For centuries, the Lao people have prized the plant not only for its fruit, but also for its leaves and edible stalk. So I'm going to break it open, and the real good stuff is in the middle here. Look at that moisture. The banana palm is loaded with electrolytes, vital minerals that get lost to perspiration. There's a lot of water in that. This is going to be a little fibrous. Well, it's not bad. It's kind of bland taste. It tastes like cattail. This is food. It's food that's not running away. It's food that didn't require a whole lot of calories to get. It's almost like a little artichoke. I'll just roll this up and, and get a little drink before I leave. It tastes really good. Hey man, what's up? The final priority before heading back into the jungle, fire. Fire gives us the ability to boil water. Fire is the key to survival. We got full sun coming down right here. Just see if we can get something that we can start I a fire with. I got a little with. bit of tinder in my you pocket. Got a little tinder? Even though Dave hasn't gotten sick from drinking unboiled water, Cody still refuses to take any chances. Let's see what we got here. Without a match or lighter, Dave and Cody turn to the contents of their backpack for an alternative fire starter. We might be able to light a fire with this lens. Absolutely. Try to get it out of here. Yep. We're going to have to break this open to get this out of here because it's screwed together. The lens on that camera is absolutely a ticket for starting this fire. Look at that, baby. 
How sweet is that? Nice. It's even convex on one side. That's beauty. Well, that's the bomb right there. Oh, yeah. You see what you got? The convex lens focuses photons, heat carrying particles from the sun into a single point. Better keep going, man. Get a good cherry on there. There's a trick to this whole thing. You have to concentrate this light in as small a beam as you can to get this to work. There it goes. There we go. Great job, Canterbury. We got fire, brother. Now, we've got to find something to boil some water. Bamboo is an excellent resource. It's also hollow, but we're going to have to find some stuff that's three, four inches in diameter. Bamboo is the fastest growing plant on Earth, and its hollow stalks, called combs, are separated by airtight joints. Hey, what's up, man? I got a piece of bamboo. I think we can boil this water in, and I got a whole condom full of water here. All right. I got about a quart anyway. Let's put that it That was way. unlubricated, right? Um, I think it was spermicidal. <laughs> <laughs> Let me, uh, be good. <laughs> Boiling nice. water at 212 degrees for a minute is the fastest way to kill pathogens. Whoa. In absence of a large fire, heating it for a long period of time will sanitize it. Let's say we get that thing up to 140 degrees and sustain the temp for 45 minutes, just pasteurize it. It'll be safe to drink. I got some slow moving elk there. Here's an inner piece of banana. Just chew it up and spit out what you don't like, man. It ain't steak. <laughs> I'm going to be spitting it all out because it tastes like <laughs> At least I can get the water out of it. Yeah. Just go to your special place and pretend. Your special survival place. All right, man. Oh, man. I give you the A for effort on the food for sure. Unfortunately, I'm just not a cow. Let's do it, man. With their river route cut short by a drop-off, Dave and Cody change course to find another traversable river from above. I can't see anything in this jungle. I'd like to get to a place up high or the vantage point where I can see something. Just trying to keep the sun on one side of me to get through all this high reed grass. There's no marked trails. So you walk in here, you're in a dense jungle all the time, surrounded by bamboo and big, giant trees. I just want you to watch your feet, man, to make sure that we're going in the right direction here. Watch yourself coming through that, Cody. Yeah, I see a clearing up here, oh, man. Oh, yes. I see a lot of light. Holy mackerel. Thank god there's a clearing. So anyone in this position, that's life itself. But I don't know how we're going to get down there. Below, a possible route to civilization. Bad news is, look where we're at. But between them and the river, near vertical terrain. I mean, this has got to be like 85 degrees down here. This is tight. Next, no supplies. It's like the duct tape of the jungle. No problem. Holy mackerel. OK. Thank god there's a clearing. In a jungle survival scenario, a traversable river is the fastest way to civilization. It's a highway out, literally, because indigenous peoples use this as a highway. The bad news is, look where we're at. I mean, this has got to be like 85 degrees down there. But we need to get down there and look around you. I mean, this is tight, yeah. We know that the river's on the west hand side and see if we can find something other than the, the wall of doom here. Yep. How's your legs and feet, Cody? They're getting pretty tired. Yeah, my legs are beat too, man. Walking through dense jungle takes time and energy. The only way to replenish the body is by resting and eating. Place like this. This has been full of water in the rainy season. A lot of it's evaporated, went down into the soil. 
that's gonna attract hoofed species of animals in here to lick and to drink this water that's left in here. Animals travel to this ecosystem from miles around to feed on the nutrient-rich mineral deposits. Smaller mammal here, probably a mouse deer of some kind. Looks like we've got a pig waller right here. They've been rubbing it with their snouts in here, trying to root up things. In a survival situation, capitalize on a place where there are signs of food and set up camp. I think this might be a good place right here, Seth. A few traps and snares. OK. I'm going to go look for a shelter area and who knows what else. I'm just going to you know, try to make life better for us. You know, it might take me a couple hours. Well, it, it ain't going to be no cakewalk for me in this jungle to make a shelter, so I'm going to need some time. Sounds good, man. Jungle construction starts with cordage. Look at this thing. This is the root of the strangler fig. Let's check this out. I mean, as far as making shelter, this is bomber cordage. It's actually a bird, eats the fig. The bird goes up to a regular tree, poops on a branch. Their seed inside that poop starts to parasitize the tree right there. And as it lives off the host tree, it sends down these roots. Look at this. I mean, look at this crazy vine. This is like the duct tape of the jungle. There's a real good funnel area right down there by a funnel log. I mean, you can tell small animals have been traveling this trail. I mean, that's what I'm looking for. We're going to do a trundle trap spring snare, and that's going to lift the animal up off the ground. This is a very nice, green, supple, springy branch, and that's what you want. The treadle snare uses a spring-loaded tree branch and noose to trap the animal. Stepping on a hidden platform triggers the snare releasing the branch and tightening the noose. When it lets go, I want it to go, just like that. So I've got two Y branches banging into the ground here. They're short. Then I just need to stick two trigger mechanisms in here, and they're separated just like this. And then I'll tie my trigger stick right in the middle of that. And to set this trigger, all I have to do is put it underneath one of these treadles so that it can't come out and put this other stick right in front of it. All that has to happen is this has to move for that to release. What I'm going to do is push down on this just like the animal would. Anything probably up to 50 pounds would be good on this, I would say. And then you just camouflage it over. Hopefully, when I come back, there's going to be an animal in here. Cody's going to cook it up, and I'm sure I'm going to enjoy every bite of it. But he's probably got a killer shelter built for me when I get back there, so he's pulling his weight, too. It rains in the Lao jungle more than 100 days a year, but without the right supplies, Ow. making a shelter that protects from a downpour is no easy task. Damn it. This is machete work, obviously. Dave has the real deal. Son of a Dividing mm. labor is essential to survival. This Even when the most important job is also the least desirable. Dave has more experience with the bigger game that, uh, I don't know. In a lot of cultures, this is women's work. This is a job. Cody's shelter will use the bamboo for structural support, strangler fig for cordage, mm. and large banana leaves for protection against rain. So I'm going to shingle it, just like the, the shingles on your house. All I need is like ginger over here and Marianne over here. Everything is just nice. Hey, man, what's up? I'm just putting some finishing touches on a shelter here. I'm glad you got a roof on it, though. Yep, that's my main concern. Have you come up with anything fire game plan? Yeah. Have we thought about that at all? if we can even get a fire. I just got done with this about 15 minutes ago. OK. So anyway, we, we have a habitation. I'm going to take uh, off. I got another trap or two I want to set. By chance, you think you can get some fire started maybe while I'm gone? I'm going to try. All right, Bob. You know, I'll sweep camp, too. And I'm just tired of being the wife, you know what I'm saying? Cody's back at camp, you know, playing Susie Homemaker, hippie guy. I'm going to be out here getting us some food. For a person lost in the Lao jungle, 
Stopping to trap animals is a game of chance. In a survival situation, when you're setting traps, it's a percentage game. You can't set one trap and expect that you're going to have an animal there the next day. You need to set 10 or 20 to increase the odds of your success. I'm going to sit in my shelter. Only the finest and primitive living. Sounds like a pig. We've got a quick clean kill. About a 40 pound pig here. That means meat, that means protein, that means Dave's fat and happy. Now, we'll take this back to Cody Homemaker, and we're gonna eat. Hopefully that's a good, good noise. Squeal, whack, no squeal. Woo! Pig meat is high in fat, which means life-saving energy in a survival situation but it can't be eaten raw. Pork is prone to being infected by the larvae of the trichinella worm and must be cooked immediately to make it safe for consumption. I mean, I've been busting my ass all day to set up traps so that we can catch something to eat, but without fire, we're not gonna be able to cook this meat. It's like a humidifier going on out here. That's not what fire likes. Hey, man, tell me you got fire. All right, brother. He's all yours. This is a real crappy situation to have to build a fire in. We got about 20 minutes of daylight now. Let's hit that real quick here. Okay. Without the right tools or help from the midday sun, friction fire may be the only option. The one I'm going to try now is called a fire saw, and it's actually one the locals use here. A fire saw uses the friction between two pieces of bamboo to create fire. So essentially, this is going to be our set. Okay, this is the piece I'll rub against. This is the piece I'll do the fire saw motion like this. And I'm gonna put the tinder that I made right in here. Bamboo shavings are placed in the basin of the top piece of bamboo for tinder. Just jam it in there. The key to friction fire is the complete absence of moisture. And the Lao jungle's humidity is close to 70%. See how it's flexing? Friction will eventually grind a hole through the top piece, hopefully creating enough heat to light the tinder. Yeah. Twirl her up there, medicine man. Make sure there's enough fine twigs there. I don't have a whole lot of tinder here. Boom, medicine man makes fire. Definitely ready to rock and roll. Careful, it's still kind of hot. Bon appetit. That's perfect right now. Mmm, damn. Tastes like bacon, don't it? Mm-hmm. Enjoy, my friend. I think we got some more strips up here that are close, real close. In a jungle survival scenario, nothing is put to waste. You want to just cut some strips and start drying it out? Smoking the pig meat overnight at low temperatures will dry it out and make it safe to eat without refrigeration. There you go. Oh, just like mom used to make. If you find a river that you think you can navigate, that's probably your ticket out of the jungle. So find a way down, stick to it, never leave it, and get yourself the hell out of that jungle. We ought to be close to the river, I would think. We've been going down quite a bit. I just want you to watch your feet, man. My feet are a little bit Fred Flintstone-ish. I'm not used to the moisture here. Once in a while, I'll get stuff poking in my feet. I'll get a vine that rips through my toes that hurts like a son of a All right. I see something up here, man. Looks like we might be coming to an opening. 
I see water, man. Let's see what we got. Oh, yeah. This is it, brother. The road to civilization, most likely. Right here. Ah. Beach right over here, man. Something dry on my feet. Arriving at the river reveals a new problem. Giant boulders along the riverbank make traveling alongside it nearly impossible. All yeah. those rocks coming down, there's just no way in hell we're gonna walk those rocks, man, on those banks. I saw a lot of bamboo coming in here, man. We might be able to throw something together that might float. And what if this drainage has some Bomber Rapids. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's a dangerous gamble, <laughs> but we can travel three times faster on this river than we're going to travel anywhere else. Well, I'd rather travel five times slower than die over a you 300-foot know, rapid. I, with I don't no disagree with you. Way out saw some, side. This isn't New York City, so it's not loud. Rapids and falls are loud. We're going to hear them coming from a long ways away. I'm from Canyon Country, man, and I know it can be a it can be a. Up next. You know, here we are, Gilgit and the Skipper, and we don't know what's around the corner. Gambling on a river takes its toll on the team. We need to go that left. I just don't want to die. For a person lost in the jungle, a river may be the fastest way out but it also may be the most dangerous one. I'm from Canyon Country, man, and I know it can be a, it can be a Well, I come from river country, so we'll figure it out between the two of us one way or the other. But I think that's the better gamble, don't you? I'm gonna acquiesce to whatever he says on this. I just don't want to die. Well, no better time like the present. Let's get on this raft thing then. All right, man. Bamboo combs are not only watertight, they're also full of air. This looks like a pretty good spot right here. But cutting them down can be a painful task. Cutting through this stuff is just like trying to cut through barbed wire. Everything that you touch spikes you and tears you up. It'll eat you alive. Cody would not want to be walking around in this with his bare feet. Ouch. Gathering vines with my body. If you believe in hell, that's where you go. You go to gather vines in the jungle. Bamboo rafts have been common in Southeast Asia for centuries, but making one is a first for Cody and Dave. One trip down, probably 15 to go. It's like walking through a piece of Velcro. Ouch. Try to get this bamboo down into the water. Then I'm gonna get some of this cordage that Cody brought down here and tie it off. And make that a pontoon. Plan is to make two of those to start off with. If this cordage is wet, it's gonna be a lot better for us because it's gonna bind better. The tighter we can get it, the better off we're gonna be, especially if we hit any of them rapids. Because it'll tear apart. I think we need a cross member on here to set the deck up of, off of this, just for stability's sake. The wider this boat is, the harder it's gonna be to negotiate small rapids. Okay. The skinnier well, it is, the easier it's gonna be. Okay. You understand yeah. what I'm saying? Okay, go. My concerns are that it's a homemade raft. <laughs> and my concerns are that I don't know this river. Nice. You know, here we are, Gilgit and the Skipper, and we don't know what's around the corner. A little bit more. There. Okay. I'm going to try to make the blade out of this bigger piece here. A river like this is going to have some rapids on it somewhere, and that's, a, that's going to be a big concern for anyone who's on a raft, because if it's not bound together tight enough and it goes through those rapids, it can shake apart. Cody, I think we're about ready to rock and roll. Ride the pony. Laos has nearly 3,000 miles of unpredictable rivers notorious for their challenging rapids. 
That's a lazy ride down the river, huh? Yeah, this beats jungle whacking. Well, my side of the raft's good. How's your side of the raft? My side of the raft's looking pretty good, man. What we don't have is knowledge of what's around that bend up there, you know? At least I don't. That sounds big, man. Oh, yeah, there's definitely a rapid up there. I mean, that's a good size one, too. Right. Yeah, we're going to have to go left. Now. Okay. Directing a raft to the deepest part of a river may prevent it from breaking apart. Heads up, going to hit the rock. Ditching it is a last resort. We need to go that left. Whoa, 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 whoa. Hold on. Ah! Dual survivals, art of self-reliance. This is a corn calc eye plant, also known as horn of the mouse deer. It's supposed to give you the strength and endurance of mouse deer. Mash this up and put it in whiskey and let it steep the longer the better. Then take a couple of shots in the morning, take a couple of shots in the afternoon. It's also an aphrodisiac. So I'm gonna put some of this in Dave's banana palm. So don't tell him. In Laos, going up against treacherous and unfamiliar rapids could be a recipe for disaster. Hold on. An unstable bamboo raft ah, is a constant threat of splitting apart on the river's boulders. Can you get it back? He's coming back. It's just almost unbelievable. I'm coming down. Good? Cowboy. Awesome, Dave. Kick ass. No problem, man. That's what we got to do, right? <laughs> Work together. I take responsibility for my partner, and if he gets hurt, then I'm gonna feel a lot worse than if I get hurt. So if there's a risk that has to be taken, I would just as soon take it. How are you doing? If I have to get wet again, it's probably not gonna be fun. Cody, you want a piece of this dried meat, man? You bet. Here, man, hang it. Oh, this is rough it. We got plenty of it in here. Mm. Too bad you're afraid of this jungle water, baby. Right, it's pretty good. Mm -hmm. I'll carry you when you have dysentery. I don't know. I haven't got sick on it yet. I'm going to well, keep drinking it sparingly, of course. I'm not chugging it down a gallon at a time, but I'm taking my chances. There's no doubt about that. Cody's not drinking the jungle water because he doesn't take some of the chances that I take, and I may be the one that pays the price. If Dave goes down with some sort of diarrhea or dysentery, it's game over. What I could probably do is he could lay on the raft and I just do it, you know, one man down the river. At least we're still moving. There's another curve coming up down here. Now let's head over that way. The next set of rapids could be worse than the last one. Could destroy the raft. I mean, anything could happen from here. I got some busted bamboo up here. I'll tell you what, Cody, I see another swell coming up. Sounds big. Which direction? Let's go over to the left while we can. I'll back paddle, and we'll catch that conveyor going over. The best way to survive a river rapid is by hitting it straight on. My oar's kind of falling apart here. I know we're having a hard time navigating this boat. Or risk getting sucked under by the force of crashing water. All right, let's go. You're good, you're good. You're good, you're good. You're the line, you got it. Intense, yeah, it was heavy duty, man.
I'm wet, our stuff is wet, and it's approaching night. Let's continue on for maybe another half an hour or so and see if this opens up to some place that's more hospitable. Let's keep paddling our butts off down here. There's a nice looking beach up there, Cody. We gotta yeah, put this boat into the night somewhere. Yeah, it looks like that might be a long boat. There's something moving on the other shore over there. That looks like people to me are red like cow. So there it is, Dave. You got the pig for us, we got water, we made shelter, we made fire, we made this awesome boat. Fire in the distance, looks like kids playing soccer. It's like idyllic. Anyone in a survival situation, especially in a jungle environment, it's spooky, it's scary, you can't see, you don't know what's from what. Your main thing is to stay calm. Follow that river, whatever it takes, work with Mother Nature to the best of your ability, and get the hell out of the situation. The lesson that needs to be taken away from this whole experience is what you carry in your head is the tools that you need to carry you through any survival situation. The bottom line is the more you know, the less you need, eh? That's exactly right, I agree. <laughs>
we really need a lot more than this. I mean, we need more rope, we need more slings, we need more beaners. So a short version is we're screwed. Short version is we don't have enough. Their first challenge is to get off the glacier before night falls. With overnight lows that'll drop below freezing, hypothermia is a deadly threat. You walk in front of me, and I'll walk behind you to be the anchor in case you fall. And up here, they've got to work together. They're literally tied to each other. The reason we want this rope to be pretty taut is if one of us falls or slips or goes over something, there's not a bunch of slack in the rope where you get jerked. OK, okay. that makes sense. It's hard to say how long of a walk we've got, so the best thing we can do is just keep heading to a lower elevation and just hope for the best. Doing good, Cody. Cody's not only an inexperienced mountaineer, he's also shoeless. He spent the last two decades without wearing shoes, an integral part of his approach to survival. I think that I would put Dave more in danger wearing those boots that I'm not used to. What I'm worried about is sliding or falling, right? You put me in those things, I feel like a ballerina. I've never heard of anyone trying to walk on snow, glaciers, or anything else in socks. And I don't know anybody else that I've ever known in my life, except Cody Lundin, that walks around with no shoes on. I wouldn't do it, because I think it's stupid. If Cody loses his footing and he starts to slide down this incline, then I'm going to have to do what's called self-arrest. And I'm going to have to take this ice axe and bury it in the uphill slope and just land on it with all my weight. Otherwise, we're both going to go down. Just a slippery. You slipping at all? Uh-uh. That's good. The sock theory's proven out, eh? Right now, my socks are sticking like crazy to this snow. I feel like Spider-Man up here. Still OK? Yeah, man, good. I don't know, man. There's something up here. Something I don't think I want anything. I can see part of it from here, man. OK, you got a crevasse. Plant your ass in the snow and plant your heels. The friction of glacial ice flows creates deep canyons called crevasses. At their edges, the ice is often highly unstable, making them a dangerous opponent for any mountaineer. But the glacier is littered with them, and getting around them could burn through hours of daylight. All right, what do you think, Cody? I don't see a way around this. So I'd say we're going to have to build an anchor and rappel down it. What? We're going to have to build a snow anchor here. We're going to have to rappel down into I think we should go around it. There's no way to go around it. We can't. Are you sure? <laughs> yeah. I'm just going to dig this trench starting at the top. Rappelling or lowering oneself down with a rope requires multiple anchors hammered into the ice, supplies Dave and Cody don't have. But in an emergency, a snow anchor is a second best choice. By digging a teardrop trench into the ice, the rope can be threaded into the channel to support their weight on rappel. So what's the deal? You just lay the rope inside the trench? We'll put the rope in the trench, and that'll be our anchor. Then we can retrieve the rope when we're done, because it'll slip right around the snow. At the bottom, we pull it back into us. It's not the safest method to rappel down the mountain, but for a climber without much gear, it could be the only option. In any survival situation, with other people, if you don't work together, you die together. This isn't Lord of the Flies. The yeah, worst thing could happen is the edge of that thing caves down in, and one of us is going to hit. Bam, dead. That's it. Broken bones, broken neck, broken back, broken legs. Doesn't matter what it is, it's going to kill you before it's over with. All right, Cody. Come on down, man. I got gotcha. you. Sure? Yep, sure. something else down there. Keep I can't down. even see the bottom of that Keep thing. Here. Dave will take the plunge first. But before going down, 
He rigs the rope so he can control Cody's descent from below, a process called belaying. If you have a problem when you're coming down, I got a if you problem say, right now. I'm going to yank on that rope, and you're going to stop dead where you're at. OK? Yeah. I have 20 plus years in outdoor survival skills, primitive living skills, et cetera, but I don't like heights. So you ready for this? As ready as I'm going to yeah. be. All right, Cody, when you get down here about 25 or 30 feet, there's a ledge you're going to have to drop over, Cody, when you get to that point. Just let yourself drop over. If you have to go to your knees, it ain't going to hurt anything. All right? OK. You roger that, Cody? Just drop off the ledge, right? Yeah. You can drop off of it on your knees if you want to. <laughs> All right? Sure. My heart rate is up. My stress level is up. I'm not going to want to go. I have to trust my partner, and I will. I'm clear. I can't see where we're going. It's very intense. Coming up. All right, I got you, man. Cody puts his life in his partner's hands. Where's this drop off? But Dave's aggressive tactics. Can I have you do the and mentally double yeah. check? Have Cody on edge. Dave's hopped up. I want him to slow down. Dave's down there, and he's in one piece. But, you know, I've got Frosty the Snowman behind me that I'm supposed to trust with my ass. And I just need to kind of do it. Thank God I don't have to look at it. Fear is a challenge for any survivalist. The body responds by going into fight or flight mode. But an overload of stress can cripple motor skills. Hey, Dave. On the way! On repel! All right, I got you, man. <sighs> Thank God I can't see anything. Look behind you, brother. You got I about. I want to. Where's this drop off? Don't worry about it. Just let some rope out. Let yourself dangle off. And just feed it through, man. You're in good shape. <laughs> good job, man. I love it. You did a good job, Cody. Thank you. You did a great Thank job, you. man. Pull it towards. <clears throat> well, that'll put hair on your chest. Getting off the ice is a critical milestone and a chance to hydrate. Water at this altitude is unspoiled by bacterial waste from animals and drinkable without filtration. But in a survival situation, water is only half the battle. The journey down the mountain burns through calories and can quickly lead to exhaustion. The whole journey, you know, as far as the relentless heat and the sun is just beating down and there is no shade, it's hard going. Check it out, man. We'll Look at the beak close. on that thing. Yeah. Birds are the first sign of life and food. And we must be disturbing their nest. Well, if they come down here, I'm going to eat them. Hey, man. Look at here. Look at here. Finally, the tree line offering them refuge from the harsh sunlight and a new <laughs> ecosystem to draw resources from. Look at that, brother. Exactly what we've been looking for, huh? Yeah. Shade. Yay. 
Oh, man, dude. I'm going to sit my ass down right here, man. At this point, we need to probably divvy up resources. I guess I better go recon a route because, I mean, we may have to pull some rope tricks out. In this situation, anyone would be a little bit fried. So I'm going to focus on trying to find something to eat. Uh, I'm going to head down this ravine here. Yeah, I'll be back within an hour. OK. Little teeny, whatever the hell that is. I haven't been to any place on the planet that doesn't have some sort of critter that crawls that you can't eat. So as much as Dave might hate this, I'm going to go for something that critters and crawls. Time and time again, indigenous peoples have proven it's the little things that keep you going in a survival situation. Mice, rats, bugs, until you get that mule deer. So we can't afford to be choosy in this situation. Come here, you little, oh, you little bugger. Here's what I'm talking about, the stereotypical night crawler or earthworm. That's pure protein to me. I don't know what Dave's going to think about that. Wash him off. I'm going to eat him. This is not the way I would want to die. Tastes like But, you know, beggars can't be choosers, eh? Whoa, look at that thing. This is probably the, the hoo-hoo grub here. Look at the size of those things, man. Hoo-hoo. The larvae of a common New Zealand beetle were considered a delicacy by the Maori, the indigenous people of New Zealand. So this is worth spending some time with this. Look at that. In just, you know, 30 seconds or so. I've been the pathfinder on this mission, getting us off the glacier, getting us on the right track and path. So I think what I'm going to do is scout down further and try to find a better route to shorter, maybe. Cody's not going to like this. The steep drop-off leads straight down into a ravine, leaving them with a choice to walk alongside it or rappel into it. Chances are we could run this thing for miles. And we've already trekked for miles, and we don't want to do that. We need to get where we're going. Dual survivals, art of self-reliance. We need to do something for my eyes, and the last thing we want is snow blindness out here. Fresh snow reflects 80% of UV radiation and can cause a condition called snow blindness, blocking the sun from above, and the reflected light from the snow is a priority. How they look, fashionable? Totally. Dave's hit on me twice. Ever since I put these on, I gotta kinda keep them away from me. We might date later on. You know, I mean, let's face it, this is the bomb. How you doing, man? Doing good. What did you find on the, on the recon? Well, I tell you, buddy, you ain't going to like it. I found a way to get through, but it's going to take probably a 60, 80 feet rappel. The canyons of New Zealand are notorious for their maze-like nature. The fastest way out and back to civilization is down but rappelling into them is no easy feat. Where does it rappel into? Some Water. mouth of Satan or Water. something? Water. Well, I've done it once, so I'll just do it again. I got you a little surprise that's under your backpack there. What is that, man? <laughs> you think I'm gonna eat that? It's a hoo-hoo grub. A hoo what? A hoo-hoo grub. <laughs> it looks like a freaking maggot. Hold it by the head, take a bite, Pull the head off, don't eat it, and a hoo-hoo. It's a tiny sausage dripping with butter. It tastes like peanut butter. Cheap-ass peanut butter. Hoo-hoo? Hoo-hoo. <laughs> More like it, man. <laughs> OK. 
Golly. Pretty gross, man. Their next task is to avoid trekking for miles around the canyon by rappelling straight into it. It's easier to go straight down to this canyon and run it out. If we have to rappel while we're inside this canyon, we're better off. We'll always have a way down, even if it's by rope. If they don't rappel, it could take days to walk alongside it, wasting valuable time and energy. Did you sure you checked everything here? Yeah, man, I mean, this, the problem is, this thing could bluff out on us at any time. It's not gonna get any better than this. It's a dangerous plan. Dave and Cody are relying on improvised harnesses from leftover climbing gear and are using a tree as their anchor. Right I'm here. asking if you're making a snap judgment. From what I can see eyeballing it, we got enough rope for this. And that's important. We got plenty of daylight right now. We probably got time to get out of this thing before it's too late and we can't get out of it. Before you go, can I have you just like stand here for a minute and just f***ing mentally double yeah. check? Yeah. You know, yeah. just for me. Yep. You know, I'm sure you got taken <laughs> care of, but Dave's hopped up. I'm not in my element at all. So I want him to slow down. He seems stressed out. I'm just out. like you, man. I mean, I get stressed out. Been hot. Well, I know. Let's 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 do this and then double check it and then triple check it, oh, yeah. okay? Cuz you're amped up. Oh, I'm amped up, all right. I don't want him going full charge over that cliff and all of a sudden I'm up here and I just hear a thump. You know what I'm saying? The release of the hormone adrenaline prepares the body for stressful situations like rappelling off a cliff. But too much of it can lead to impulsive behavior and disastrous results. So that's cool. That's hooked up right. Your harness, the yep. rope's the way you want it in your pack. Yep. Remember, on rappel. On rappel. On belay, on belay. you go. Okay. To avoid losing their only rope, the plan is to pull it down once inside the canyon. But if the rope gets caught, they'll be forced to continue without it. I don't know what Dave's let us down into. He's saying this is the only place to cross. He's reconned it. I don't have any other options. We need to keep moving, and we need to keep moving safely. Here, boys. This is the man stuff. Cody's gonna die when he comes over this. When he swings on that rope off that anchor, he's gonna freak him out. If someone is in this situation and the only way out is to do something like this, they need to bite the bullet and, and do it, but do it as safely as possible. Check, recheck, recheck, and then realize, you know, this is the ticket out. Pray, whatever it takes, get the courage to go over the edge safely and do it. I repent! Now, deep inside the canyon, there is no way out except to continue down, and they've still got only one rope to help. There's a waterfall. We could just probably slide down on our back. All right? Yeah. I think Dave's hopped up. I want him to slow down. Well, there's a fall over here, Cody, off to this side, but we can fly down this first to get there. We've blown a lot of energy, and now we're doing this stuff. So I'm going to try to make him psychologically slow down. In a survival situation, when you're carrying a minimal amount of gear like we are, bottom line of this thing is there's no going back up. 
The sun's going down. Hypothermia will be right around the corner at that point. Come here, man. Look at this. Uh-oh. Yeah, that's going to be a problem. Cody and Dave are canyoneering with limited supplies, making their way back to civilization from New Zealand's labyrinth of canyons. Let's see if we can find a place for a natural anchor, and I guess we're going to have to probably cut this rope now. Can you climb back out here and up over? Yeah, maybe. See what's over on this side, maybe. Because I can't see around this rock without crawling into that fall. Yeah, this, this thing is massive. So this is a scary deal, even for me. Yeah, we can use this rock. It's just going to take a lot of rope to do that. Once you go over there, They'll slice off a section of the rope and tie it around the boulder, using it as an anchor for their third rappel, this time down an icy glacial waterfall. Right there, Cody. Wait. Got it. All right. There's no guarantee of a safe landing. The rope could entangle them, and the waterfall could push them underwater. It's a leap of faith. There's no doubt about that. We had to cut our rope to make an anchor. We lost about seven or eight feet of rope. So if it's seven or eight feet from touching the bottom, that's seven or eight feet Cody's going to hide. We're going to have to drop off this rope into a pool with unknown depth right now. So that's a big deal to me. And I'm a little worried about it. I'm definitely worried about Cody going over this. OK, man. On a waterfall rappel, facing outward and looking down minimizes the risk of drowning. I just want to get it over with. You know, I've developed a climbing system that works for me. Shut up, trust Dave, and don't look down. I was gonna get hypothermia waiting on you, brother. I was shaking, man. How you feeling? What is cold. <laughs> it's getting later in the day. I'm totally soaked now. I can feel myself start to shiver, so if a person in this situation got stuck in a canyon like this and it got dark and all their clothes are wet, very bad setup for hypothermia. Surviving in the frigid canyon is a race against time. When the body's temperature drops, the hypothalamus sets off shivering to create heat. This expends extra energy and leads to exhaustion. It looks like it's starting to open up a little bit. Man, let's just head for that, you know? OK. What do you think? OK. I'm right behind you. A long day in the canyon results in a drop of 1,000 feet in elevation. But daylight is fading fast, and in a survival situation, finding safe shelter is critical. Come and check this out, man. Looks like there's a rock right here sticking out, man. We don't even have to cut much trees to get in there. We slip right up in that hole right there. The wind's cut now by 90%. Totally blocked right there. What do you think? That's the best I've seen. The natural shelter provides protection from both wind and rain. You know, this shelter doesn't look like much, but if you can have Ma Nature work for you, with just breaking off five or six branches, we have a little shelter here with very little calories spent. And that's key, especially in a situation like this, where people might have low calories, low energy, or both, 
Yeah, this is nice. Oh, yeah, man. I could sleep here for days. <sighs> yeah. I was a little bit damp, but heck, fire. Before breaking camp, basic survivalist strategy makes food priority number one. Hey, you know, since we're down toward the low area, I'm gonna do a quick uh, recon. Okay. And I'm gonna take the rest of those hoo-hoo grubs and see if I can, you know, maybe do some fishing, because the water, I think, it's a lot slower down there. I definitely won't waste any time while you're gone. I'll get some stuff done. Okay, I'll be back in a bit. All right, man. Now that they've made it to a safer elevation below the tree line, Cody's ready to go after some bigger game. This was kind of a little pondy lake area, but now it's starting to get really narrow. So maybe I could hand fish this area for eel or whatever they might have in here. New Zealand has some of the world's biggest freshwater eel thriving in narrow water channels from mountain runoff. The cool thing about fishing is there's not a, a lot of me burning calories to do that. The first step is making a fishing line that can pull in an eel close enough for Cody to grab. When I can come up to this flax plant and realize that it won't break when I pull it, I know instinctively that I can make cord out of it. I don't know anything more about this plant, but I know I can make string out of it just because of the properties that it has. By braiding together a few strands of fiber from the plant, its strength increases exponentially. I'm just gonna start like this and grab that top fiber, twist it away from me, trap the bottom bundle, and twist my wrist back toward me. So boom, boom, boom. That's one ply. Grab the top one, twist it away from you, trap the bottom bundle, and twist your wrist back towards you. And you just keep repeating that process over and over. When I keep doing this, it starts to look a lot like string you'd buy from the store. And this is really, really tough stuff. So this is probably overkill for fishing line, but the eels around here, I mean, they've been recorded to over 100 pounds. The Maori hand-fished eel for generations, and just like them, Cody plans to lure in the eel with the scent of his bait. Eels have an amazing sense of smell, so I'm gonna kinda mash these grubs so that they have more scent when they're in the water. But to catch them, Cody's using his own sock as the hook. Eel have inward-facing teeth that should get snagged on the wool fibers when they bite. There's a nice undercut bank here. Dave's done more share of his work on this adventure, so I'd love to bring back a nice, you know, fat eel. Back at camp, Dave creates a new use for the climbing rope. This climbing rope is an everyday object. Lots of people carry climbing rope when they go out in the woods. The inner cords are gonna allow me to do a lot of different things if I need to. I mean, you can make bow drills with this. You could break this down further and use it for suturing material if you had to. I'm going to build a net that Cody and I can use for a backpack. A net is a very, very handy item to have and very important to know how to build in a survival situation. What you need to do with this is take your strands singly. You can decide how big you want your net holes to be. In this case, I made these net holes about four inches. The first step is to tie clove hitch knots on each strand. Then Dave ties another series of alternating knots, creating the netting. And then when you got down to your last one, we'll have a usable net. I mean, it's not perfect by any means, but it'll definitely do the job. Next. How deep do you think that is? Caught on a floodplain. No, don't go backwards, Cody. It's just pushing me down. In a punishing current. You can swim, right? Cody!
Sorry, brother. You know, I don't, I'm not crazy about killing stuff. This is a hell of a lot of meat. It's half my height, if not more. It weighs probably at least 10 or 12 pounds. This doesn't always happen. It's rare to get this big of an animal, but you know, no complaints here. Drying eel is a traditional Maori method. It also has added survival benefits. You know, if we dry this eel as opposed to cook it, it doesn't go bad. As soon as the surface area dries, the blowflies or any sort of flies can't lay maggots. With the heat of the New Zealand sun, we're good to go. And I'll keep the head on again for easy transport. Howdy. What the hell you got, man? I have an eel. Holy cow, man, that is awesome. What you got there? I found out after you left, we cut that rope off. Yesterday, it had like seven inner strands in it, almost like Shoot. a piece of paracord. Oh, well. So I figured I'd make us a gill net, and you can use it for a backpack if we have to take some awesome. stuff with us. That's so. great. Yeah. So what do you think, man? Fire and meat, right? Well, I, we got meat, but why do you want to build a fire? Cook it right now. Yeah, well, we can eat some raw. We got to keep moving, too, though, man. I could dry this on my back as we're moving, but we can eat some of this right now, man. We could cook that thing, even sear it, you know, in the 15 minutes it would take us to start a bow drill fire. OK, so we, we look around for firewood sticks. Then we take the time to do that. Then we gather firewood. Then we build a fire. Then we cook it. Then how many hands of daylight is that? Do I want to eat it raw? Hell no, I don't want to eat it raw. That's like eating sushi. I don't want that crap. I don't eat raw fish because I'm American. I want red meat from four-legged animals. We got an eel, but I want the damn thing cooked. So I, I hear you. You know, I would like to build a fire and hang here, but we can eat pieces of it raw, we can eat pieces of it dry as we're moving and getting out of this situation. We're in the mountains, and the weather can change like that. I want to move. Donner Party, classic example. They rested their oxen for two extra days, and those two extra days screwed them for trying to get over the summit. So just because it seems calm, I never take that stuff for granted. OK, here, crumb cake. We're going to agree to disagree on this one. We're going to do what we got to do. Definitely oily, so that's good news. Yeah, it does have an oily flavor to it. I like the eel. It does have kind of a weird aftertaste that kind of turns Dave off, but the bottom line is it's calories, man. And in a survival situation, you can't be choosy. Continuing down the hills toward a valley is the best option when looking for civilization. But valleys often have rivers, and this one's nearly a quarter mile wide, filled with icy mountain runoff, and glacial silt lining the riverbed can be as treacherous as quicksand. This water over here is pretty deep, man. You can tell by these ripples, yeah. these big long waves. Maybe down there by that point around where that eddy comes around, it might be a little shallower. Are you dead set? Going I mean, that way. I don't see anything down this way. Yeah. Do you? No, at least it's going downstream, too. So, so. I'm thinking we need to get okay. to the other side. OK, let me cut some willows. How deep do you think that is? Well, it's hard to say, man. I mean, it could be waist deep. It could be, you know, neck deep. Rivers kill people every year where I come from, especially with a heavy pack on your back like I'm carrying. Uh, or Cody, he could slip under the rocks, get caught on something with that net, he's done. He's going to drown. What we're going to do is I'm going to take the brunt of the force, and I'm going to be upstream, and I'm going to pull with this up current. And Dave's going to lean against me, and I'm going to break the current for him. I'm following your footsteps for the most part, bro. Pretty tight out here. You think? Just two feet of fast-moving river water has enough force to sweep away a pickup truck. Hold on, it's yeah. easy. Getting real deep. There's a hole right here. Look here. There's a hole right beside me. There you go. You all right? It's just pushing me down. You can swim, right? It's going to get deep again. You got to have a choice. It's going to be deep no matter what. It's this thick is disappearing. No, don't go backwards, Cody. 
When you get deeper in the water, there's no rush now. It's easier. Now push it down at an angle. Piece oh, of cake, Daddy-o. I wasn't sure about that one. It got <laughs> deeper and deeper. Riverbeds are subject to flash floods. Wide open areas like this one are not a safe place to stay for very long. In any sort of situation where you're in a massive floodplain, get out of it. There's wet under my feet, so we're in an active river bed. I do not want to shelter out here. This river widens out really bad right here. We're going to have to get across this thing someplace. We got an hour before that sun's going down. I know and if we're going to get wet, we need to get wet now. I know, yeah, it's windy, so I don't want Let's do it as soon as possible. Who's going to take the swim, brother? Well, I got less stuff to take off, so let me take this one. All right, you got it. The quickest way is straight across, but the river ahead is too deep to wade through. OK, I'm going to stay about right here, Cody. In case you don't make it to the other side or something happens, I can throw you a rope. I'm going to stay down a little bit downstream from you. You might want to go a little bit further than now. that. This is going to push me out pretty quick. I'm okay. going to go in about right here. All right, man, whenever you're ready. You ready? Yep. The safest way to cross a fast-moving river with a partner is to be reeled in. I'm going to tie a hand loop in this, in this rope. Don't want to ever tie a rope to yourself. You can get drug under the current, catch on a rock, a piece of driftwood, and drown. So you just want to loop in there to hold on to in case something happens. You can always let go. In a survival scenario, when you're the anchor, when you're the lifeline, whether it's rappelling or doing a river crossing like this, it's it. You know, you put your money where your mouth is and you just pull like hell and get it done. But, you know, he, I trusted him the last few days on the end of the line, and now he kind of had to trust me. As the sun starts to set, Dave and Cody reach the other side of the river basin, and civilization is finally in sight. There's a fence up there. Oh, yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> Horses. Oh, yeah, there's people here. Nice. Sure. Man, good job, brother. Made it again, huh? That was a haul. All right, man. <laughs> Anybody can get through a survival situation like this if they understand some key elements. You have to make intelligent decisions. You have to move slow. You have to think about every move you make and everything you do if you want to survive. Any sort of survival situation, especially something like this, requires a lot of determination, hopefully training, physical fitness. You never give up. Adaptability, improvise and adapt to the max, and a hell of a lot of luck, because there is no guarantee. There is no guarantee. Central American country is known for desolate beaches bordering untamed jungle. 
But in the middle of this unforgiving subtropical forest lies the most elaborate network of subterranean caves on the planet. Diving into this dark underwater maze is the new frontier of adventure exploration. But it's a dangerous game. Getting disoriented and running out of air kills an estimated 20 people around the world each year. Those who do survive can emerge to find themselves lost in a dark underground labyrinth surrounded by uninhabited jungle miles from civilization. Imagine you're in 500 miles of unresearched caves. There's some in the middle of the jungle filled with water, many of them hundreds of miles that have never been tracked, never been traced, no one's ever been in them. It's very easy in a cave like this to take a wrong turn and go somewhere that doesn't have a way out. That's a bad situation. Escaping the underground caves and the surrounding jungle is a scenario that survival experts Dave Canterbury and Cody Lundin are going to face head on. It's a firestorm for panic and disorientation and death. The most important thing in a cave right now, to me and Cody, is this light. The battery light dies, anything like that, and you're dead. We've got typical dive gear for a single diver. Escaping Belize's dark network of caves and jungle is difficult, even for the well-equipped. But survival experts Dave Canterbury and Cody Lundin have a challenge. What do you want to take? To use only what a lost scuba diver might have with them. I want to take as much stuff as possible without being stupid about it. Dave Canterbury is an ex-army sniper who spent two years as a commercial diver. We've got a set of gauges, a tank pressure gauge, and most likely a depth gauge. Known for his creative approach to survival, his knowledge of dive gear will be crucial in this scenario. We've got the buoyancy compensator that we can use to put water in. His partner is Cody Lundin, a teacher of primitive survival skills who lives in an underground home in Arizona. But there's nothing familiar about being deep under the jungle. You're in a completely different environment, and you need to adapt to a completely different set of rules. You're trusting your sense of direction and orientation in a world where up is down and down is up. The first rule of survival, never carry more than you need. What are we going to leave? I think the only thing we leave behind is, is the tank, pretty much. Okay. It's dead weight. Cody and Dave will take a buoyancy compensator, a dive knife, a mask, and several gauges. The most critical gear, a dive light and two headlamps. Imagine you're in 500 miles of unresearched caves with a few flashlight batteries. That would tend to strike horror. You know, I'm an adrenaline junkie. I like adventure, but I like to be able to control my own destiny. And once you get into a dark cave, you're not controlling your own destiny anymore. Is this a full wetsuit or? I don't know. I didn't look at it. Full wetsuit. Maybe I can make an improvised backpack by tying the legs and the arms off on this. OK. <laughs> How's it look? Fashionable? Oh, yeah. Probably be neoprene backpacks all over Miami Beach next week. You're damn right. Above ground, the sun's a great way to navigate. But down here in this cave, one of the best ways and tickets out is to follow the water. What do you see, man? Well, the flow's up there. The downstream's probably our best bet. Normally, following the river downstream will lead to civilization. But rules can change in a deep cave system. But what if this just continues to go down? I mean, we need to climb out of this cave. It's the proverbial fork in the road. You know, we came down, and the flow is obvious. But in this scenario, is downstream the right way? Not necessarily. It could be down, 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 even deeper to where Gollum lives. There's driftwood right there, and it's pretty sizable stuff. We know it didn't walk upstream. That sizable piece of wood had to come through one hell of a hole. Yeah, you're right. 
And if there was an opening big enough in this cave for this driftwood to get into, then we can definitely get out. I think we take a chance. OK. You want to take point? <laughs> Cody and Dave defy survival code and head upstream. Now, there's some slick areas in here, that's for sure. The limestone floor has been eroded by acidic water for thousands of years, making it slick and unpredictable. And especially challenging for Cody, who hasn't worn shoes for over 20 years. Footwear is not necessarily good for the foot. People that wear shoes tend to land on their heel, and it's more jarring to the body. I walk differently than most people. I kind of put my, the front part of my foot down first. It cushions my body from my body weight by walking in that nature. But his unique survival philosophy could become a liability here. Watch yourself coming through that, Cody. Being stranded in a cave underground is really freaky. You know, it's a totally different environment down here. But there are clues that come from above ground that can help you get the hell out of the situation. Weird smell here. It's full of bat crap. What's that? Bats. It doesn't mean we can get out, but there's definitely bats in here. We've seen a lot of bats in the last few minutes, and that's a good sign for us. You've got fruit eating bats, and you've got insect eating bats. The fruit eating bats make these holes because they sleep in big clusters. These bats have to go out to eat fruit, obviously, and I eat fruit in this cave. And the exit's probably not too far away. OK. Well, we just got to check it out. I'm tired of being in this dark, damp ass cave. Water's getting louder. That's probably a good thing. Holy. There might be a chance that there's something up above that that we can you know, find a way out of here. So we're going to have to get up there one way or the other. You know, there's so many things that could go wrong in a scenario like this. Because if I trip and have a mechanical injury and break a leg or a hip or even twist an ankle and Cody has to try to carry me, that's a much bigger problem than anything else right now. Woo! In a survival situation, sometimes you have to take a chance because 80 feet around the corner from one of them waterfalls would be a way out of here. I'm not feeling too good about this situation. I don't like heights, but I don't know what other choice we have. The fast moving current of the waterfall makes these rocks more slick than anywhere in the cave and puts Cody's bare feet to the test. What we're doing right now is dangerous beyond the shadow of a doubt. Right, I got you, man. You all right? Sure. In your survival situation, you need to take advantage of every opportunity that presents itself to you. We've got fast-moving water right here. I'm going to cut the hose off this buoyancy compensator and fill it with water and use it for a canteen. A buoyancy compensator is normally filled with air to lighten the diver's weight, but it can also be used to hold a vital survival necessity. That whole side's full. That whole side's full of water. There's probably a good two, three gallons of water in there right now. We need to get the hell out of here. Yeah, let's, let's go, keep man. Going. Turn your light off for a minute. Look at that. Oh, man, that's daylight. Oh, we need to get over there, brother, quick. Now that we're out of the cave, that part's over. So psychologically, as far as a survivor attitude, that's a huge step that was just taken to get out of the darkness and into the light. Belize is covered in over 4,000 square miles of dense tropical rainforest. The first order of business, orientation. We really need to head east because east is going to be toward the coast. That's where the most human population is going to be, is in the coastal areas of any place. But they'll have to do it without the aid of the most important navigational tool. The problem is now we have no sun. I don't know which way east is, do you know? No, I don't. Well, I don't know what to do next. Coming up. Obviously, this is not the perfect way to navigate. Dave and Cody show what it takes to survive without the most basic of jungle tools. What Dave and I don't have, and I wish we did, was obviously machete. And later, Cody's feet may have finally met their match. This stuff sucks. 
Snake Cody, snake. Oh. While Dave's primal instincts kick into overdrive. We're not giving any more meat away. We really need to head east because east is going to be toward the coast. That's where the most human population is going to be, is in the coastal areas of any place. I don't know which way east is, do you know? No, I don't, but the problem is now we have no sun. I don't know what to do next. Thick jungle canopy and heavy cloud cover make determining orientation without a compass a guessing game. We can't really tell where we are via orientation from the sun. Everything looks the same. It's monotone here in the jungle. So we're going to have to rig some way to find direction. I think that we might have the stuff in that pack to figure it out. OK, let's do it. All right. Seeing this uh, magnet defogger inside this mask gave me an idea of a way we might be able to make a compass. To prevent fogging, dive masks have magnets, the key component in a compass. It looks like this would be really good to float my compass in. I'm going to save this parabolic lens for something else later. Now I don't want to damage this at all. I'm going to put it in my pocket. If I strip this plastic off of this, I actually have a set of magnets here. And these magnets will have polarity, positive and negative. And if I can get this magnet to stand up on its end, it should point the front and back of the magnet to a north and south direction. I'm just going to try to get a little bit of water in this lens of this flashlight. I'm going to try to stand this magnet up on its end inside here and see which way it points. The Earth is surrounded by a magnetic field with positive and negative charges directed toward each pole. Whenever possible, a magnet will line itself up with that north-south line. If I move it with the tip of my finger, it moves right back where it came from. So now we know that we've got a north-south line running this way, which means we got to figure out which way is which. Using foliage growth as a guide may help determine which direction is north and which is south. If I look at these trees, everything is growing facing that direction. Because we're still in the northern hemisphere, most of the branches are growing on this side of the tree so they can get that southern exposure. Trees seek out the sun to stay alive and will grow thickest on the side that gets the most light. So I'm going to say that way south and that way is north which means east is over here, mm -hmm. and that's the direction we need to go. I think that's probably our best bet. You know, obviously, this is not a perfect way to navigate. Your optimum choice is to have a compass with you all the time. If you don't have that, you need to either make use of what you have around you or make educated guesses. Navigating east toward the ocean may be the shortest route, but some of the most poisonous plants in the world call this jungle home. It's a real challenge walking to rip ass your head off jungle country with no machete, with sketchy improvised compass. And I'm barefoot. Get one in you, man? Yeah. Welcome to the jungle. In the rainforest, a mere scratch can lead to tropical ulcer, a vicious mycobacteria that can erode muscles and tendons. I think we're turning the corner on the saddle here. May, may have made a good move there, even though it wasn't maybe the smartest thing to do. You know, we're starting to lose some light. We might better thinking about hunkering down for the night, man. This is one of the most open areas we've seen. Yeah, we can dump packs here. That's good enough for me. We're going to have to build a shelter in case it rains tonight because it's a little overcast right now. In a survival situation like this in the jungle, staying dry is one of the most important things that you can do. For a shelter like this, Probably use a basic structure. And then we'll use this material for the roof. What Dave and I don't have, and I wish we did, was obviously a machete. But I can take this blade and add mass to it by hitting the back of the blade with something called a baton to force the blade into greenwood. So I don't recommend this with dry wood. We got enough of these now to start us off. Now we need some vines. There are over 2,500 species of vine in the Belize rainforest, making up 40% of the dense overhead canopy. There's just every resource you could possibly need to find here. You just have to know where to look for it. Vine can be used for the most important survival construction material, cordage. You can't pull it on itself and knot it without breaking. It's not going to be any good. 
So you gotta find the right vine. This stuff here is green. This is gonna be good vine right here. I want as much of this as I can get. This is great shelter material right here. I mean, this stuff, you get, you know, five, six rolls like that, you're in pretty good shape. I think I've got enough right here now to maybe even go up and start getting something put together over here. What's up, man? More stuff. All we really need to do is throw it together. So if you want to give me a hand. Belize gets over 100 days of rain each year. Proper shelter here needs to be strong enough to hold up in a potential downpour. All right, that's not going anywhere. All right, now I'm trying to put shingles on here, if you will. These leaves actually have a natural channel in them that will channel water down. And the uh, process for this is uh, we want to make sure that all these things are turned up this way so this channel right here collects the rain. And I'll just put four on in one layer, and then I'll put four more on up here until we get to the top, and then we'll have basically a rain-proof roof on this thing. You want me to stay over here? Yeah. That'd probably be the best idea for now. Let me hand them over to you. Yeah, I'm good on this side. You got four? Yep. I mean, this is exactly how the locals do it in the jungle. This is how they make their shelters, keep them dry. You could live in this thing for quite a while if you had to. I want to get a gold star for neatness. I want to get a gold star for dryness. <laughs> well, you know what I do in my courses, Dave, is after we do this, I'm going to have you lay under there. I'm going to pee on it. Yeah, that ain't going to happen. <laughs> the next step building two beds that are raised off the ground. For jungle cultures, being able to sleep off the ground was a huge asset because it offered protection from snakes, scorpions, venomous spiders. What I'm doing is just doing the old proverbial wide sticks in the ground to make a raised bed off that. That should probably be good. I'm a hammock sleeping kind of guy. I don't like sleeping on the ground. I don't like sleeping on raised beds. I like sleeping in a hammock. Weaving vine into a hammock has been a method used by indigenous cultures for generations. The key issue with this thing right now is just to try to keep it stable on this tree. Just like this. This is some mighty fine sleeping right here. That's total Flintstones. There are only two hours of daylight left but an important nighttime survival necessity still hasn't been addressed. Right now, our problem is that we don't have fire. The whole point of the fire is it keeps away a lot of wild animals from coming around your camp. Without a campfire, you're basically inviting them in because you smell like a human. The sun breaks through the clouds sporadically in the jungle, and when it does, take advantage of it. Jungles are a complete pain in the ass when it comes to starting fire because everything's always wet. And there's very few places for the sun to come down. And you gotta take advantage of it when you can get it. I've got some material I collected here. I've got this parabolic lens out of the flashlight. I've got a beam of sun coming through here. I don't even know if it's gonna be bright enough or not. We're gonna find out here real quick like that. A reflective fire will only work with a direct, sustained beam of sunlight. And it's just a matter of positioning this thing in the right spot to get the beam concentrated on this tinder. The process of this is pretty simple. You just put something up through the middle and just reflect the sun's radiation to a spot as small as you can get it. Dual survival's art of self-reliance. This is a very, very cool tree for us to find out here. This is called the give and take tree. And the reason they call it that is because it will give you pain, but also will take away your pain. And these spines have a poison in them that is an anticoagulant. And when you pull the spine out, it continues to bleed because of that. But if you cut the spines away from the tree, and this thin layer of inner bark has a coagulant property, put those on the wound where you've stuck yourself, and it will make the blood coagulate. It also takes away the pain as well. Got a beam of sun coming through here. I don't even know if it's gonna be bright enough or not. Fire is one of the most important elements of nighttime survival in a jungle. Besides being a deterrent against predators, the smoke is essential to ward off disease-carrying mosquitoes. The sun went behind a tree. 
Without strong enough sunlight to start fire, there are other resources scattered on the jungle floor. What's cool about this stone is it was used maybe up to 6,000 years ago. These are Hertz and Cone fractures on this stone. So in other words, some Mayan Indian a long time ago took this stone at this angle and fractured off flakes to strike a spark. So I'm gonna do essentially what they did. We're just gonna fracture a piece off this to use. So look how that breaks. I mean, I could skin a fish with that. Or I can take that edge with my carbon steel blade and get those sparks. I'm actually shaving pieces of this carbon steel off the back of my knife, and that's what's creating the sparks. Only extremely flammable tinder will catch the spark, a scarce resource in the rainforest. So what I'm doing is creating more surface area with this stuff that's the driest thing that we have out here. The less surface area I have, the more heat it takes to bring it to combustion temperature. I'm just gonna put it here and hold it with my thumb and hope some sparks bounce up here and take it. I could be here until two in the morning doing this. I think the Maya are laughing at me at this point. You know, but again, what are our options here? At least we know we tried. So I'm gonna have to report Dave, it's a no-go. Without fire, Nocturnal predators will be a concern, but there is another defense against mosquito infestation. Here's something Dave and I can use. This place is a sacred area because everything here does something. The jungle is the pharmacy. That's where they get a lot of the original botanicals to treat whatever disease you have. See this plant with the yellow flowers? It's jackass bitters. It's a topical thing for bugs. Why the bugs don't like it and why it's called jackass bitters is it's bitter as hell. So I'm getting hammered pretty good with the bugs out here. So I'm gonna process this up. And there's several plants I would use the same way in Arizona, for mosquitoes or deer flies or whatnot. I break it down to expose a lot of surface area to have the volatile oils released more. Spit, or add some water, and just kinda get a whatever I can get with a lot of surface area and a little bit of moisture in there to apply it onto my skin. As you can see that slight green sheen, especially in my hand where I'm processing it. And I'll take some back to Dave. Dave's the smart one. He's wearing something called clothing. So, but I'll deal with this one way or another. We make those little bastards have to go through this wall of jackassy bitter stuff to try to get a piece of old coating. Hey man. Since I choked on fire, take take half of these jackass bitters for some insect repellent. Ah, you've been holding out on me today, man. Good thing the bugs haven't been bothering me too Rip bad. Rip them up, add some spit, and yeah. apply where needed. Ancient Mayans also used jackass bitters as a malaria treatment by making a tea out of its leaves. I'm still pretty wet. I'm pretty dry. The advantage of not wearing many clothes and not wearing shoes and boots. I'm kind of envious of that sometimes, especially when I'm soaking wet. What I wouldn't give for a cheeseburger or a steak about right now. <laughs> Here I am with Dave and the crickets are chirping. And we ain't no burping, cause we haven't had no chow. <laughs> nice. Today we're heading east. That's our plan. We've got to get out of this jungle and get to the coast as fast as we can. The sun came up this morning nice and bright. It comes up in the east, we're following the sun. Before heading into the unknown, gathering supplies is a first priority. You know, I want to go get some calories for us, and I'm not going to probably bring back a mastodon or anything, but there's a lot of easy to get stuff. I'm all about easy to get. Look at the size of these kahoon nuts. Kahoon nuts were an ancient Mayan staple. They're rich in fats and similar in taste to the coconut. So that's just, in my mind, uh, proteins and carbs that aren't running very fast. So hopefully Dave will be happy to see that. Hey, home slice. I got some food that you won't like. If you're hungry, you'll eat just about anything, right? This is the edible part here. To me, it kind of tastes like top sirloin, like the good cut on an Angus variety beef cow. Nice try. OK. Tastes like it. <laughs> <laughs> 
Cody lives a different lifestyle than I live, and Cody likes to eat, you know, what Mother Nature provides. So he loves that stuff. You know, he's sitting there just swimming in those Cahoon nuts. Or me, you know, if I don't have a big fat juicy steak in front of me, I'm not happy. For me, it doesn't get any better than fats. 9.3 kilocalories per gram of, of Go Power compared to 3.7 or 3.4 for carbohydrates and proteins. But the Maya used to use this because of the oil content for beauty products, for their hair and stuff. Oh, well, there you go, so, the ponytail yeah. grease. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm just gonna pack up these, and you can go back to being famished if you'd like. <laughs> no thanks, man. Heading east to the ocean may be the best bet at finding civilization, but the dense Belizean rainforest is a perilous obstacle. Ah, for a machete, Dave. Yeah, no kidding. How much would you pay for a machete right now? Uh, I'd trade a lot of kahoon nuts. Hey, Cody. Yeah. I see an opening up here. It looks like it goes into like a grass flat. It's opening up out here, Cody. Oh, my goodness. Look at this, man. I'm so... Oh, man. Oh, feel that breeze, man. That's beautiful. It's nice to be able to see more than 20 feet. Yeah. I'm a prairie kid. I'm used to being able to see. So as far as psychology and survival, which survival is 90% psychology, just busting out of that jungle into the savannah is like awesome. Do you want to rest or do you want to boogie on? No, I say we haul, man. We got to get to the coast before dark comes up. OK, let's do it. All right. Leaving the jungle means easier travel. But the savanna brings new hazards. This is classic snake territory out here, man. Classic. You saying that to make me feel better? Yeah. I'm saying it to make you pay more attention, I guess, maybe. I don't <laughs> know. I've been looking for snakes because I'm really fond of snakes and lizards and reptiles in general. Everything has its purpose in the ecosystem, including reptiles. They just get a bad reputation. But what's worrying me right now is Cody's barefoot. Snake, Cody, snake! Whoa. There are over 50 species of snakes in Belize. Many contain deadly venom and will attack when threatened. Snake, Cody, snake! Whoa. But capturing one could also mean the next meal. Hell, what Two kind of boa constrictors, man. Here it is, right here. Grab it. It's okay. They're not poisonous. Don't worry about that. Boas are non-venomous, but still deadly. They coil themselves around their prey, squeezing until blood can no longer circulate. Man, what a meal that is, buddy. What do you think they're doing? Well, I'm, see how she's all opened up right oh, there? Oh, yeah. They were mating. We just disturbed them coming up here. So you broke into their bedroom? Uh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. If her eggs are fertilized, in four months, the female will give birth to about 25 live baby snakes. Pregnancy takes a physical toll on females, and they will only attempt to reproduce every other year. To whack one of these to eat is way bad juju in my mind. Well, you and know. These are literally propagating the species. In a survival situation, we would not be very smart to turn this kind of food down. Yeah, in a long-term situation, you know, we're taking out future food, you know? These were mating snakes. If this was a furry critter, I'd be disagreeing with you a whole lot more, OK? The fact of the matter is my love for reptiles alone tells me I don't want to eat something this beautiful unless I'm hungry, hungry, hungry. And I'm not. So I'm, I'm going to agree with you that we let these go and let them mate and find something better down the road. That was way cool. Just slide him right down in here behind her, man. And they rub across each other like that, and they rub their scent on each other, and that's how they flirt. Let them flirt. Oh, man. That's a lot of meat, brother. <laughs> that's a lot of meat. Belize is landlocked to the west, but to the east lies the ocean. And where there's a coast, there's a good chance of finding civilization. Looks like we might be coming to the end of the savannah up here. We've been 
traveling, we've had a lot of small thickets of palmettos here and there, small palmettos, but nothing like what this looks like. It's like a palmetto forest up here. See how black this soil is in here? All that dark gray alkali in the soil. That's why nothing's growing in here but these freaking palm trees. That's a good sign for us, though, because that means we're getting into more swampy territory, which should be getting closer to the coast. We're not in Kansas anymore. No, you're right about that. This is definitely a drastic change, and I don't know if it's for the better, to tell you the truth. It's like a wall from hell. I agree. You know? The issue that I've got with this is they're razor sharp. They got a lot of thorns on them. With Cody out here in shorts and no shoes, it's going to be an issue. Cutting through the palmettos may be dangerous, but it's also the most direct route. Walking around, it may cost us two or three hours. We don't have. I'll follow you, man. All right. In a lot of survival situations, you want to get rescued as soon as possible. So we don't have the luxury of wandering around this palmetto grove. We need to go through it, albeit slow. It's really our only option in this situation. You got these palmetto palms in here, and every time you walk and you try to move one of these things out of the way, I mean, it just sticks right in your skin. If you brush up across it, it'll just lay you wide open. This stuff sucks. It's slow going, real slow going. Everything wants a piece of you in here. We just have to stop every once in a while and get our bearings. The bugs are fierce in here, and so are the snakes. Oh, son of a How you doing back there, partner? I'm doing OK. We just need to go slow. There's been caves. There's been hardcore jungle. There's been savanna. And now we have the palmetto forest. And uh, I think I like this one the least. You hear that, Cody? Yeah. Sounds like the ocean, man. Let's just keep walking toward that sound, man. Man, Cody, that noise is getting a lot louder up here. Hey, man. Look, water, man. Look at that, man. That look. feels good. Look. Oh, yeah. That is ocean waves crashing, baby. Nice. Nice. I think we're done going east. Yeah, we're done going east, that's for sure. Next. These are a premium. One collects trash. These are the kind of things that we're going to need. The other? Dave! Dave! Dinner. What do you got, Cody? Heading east in Belize eventually leads to one thing. That is ocean waves crashing, baby. I think we're done going east. And in a survival scenario, a coastline could be the ticket to rescue. You know, we've gained a lot of advantage by coming out here to this beach because now, number one, we have increased our visibility. And we can follow this beach one way or the other. Sooner or later, it will run into civilization of some kind, whether it's a fishing village or a Walmart. Now it's time to figure out what we're going to do now, huh? Yeah. We're going to run out of daylight. I think we should recon, split up, drop our gear here, and look for resources. The sun's going down, so Dave and I need to break up and prioritize tasks for survival now. One of the most important factors in long-term survival is food. That's what I'm going to do. And Dave's going to try to maximize the sun rays to make a fire. Well, I'm going to try to start a reflective fire here. We got this lens that came off our flashlight, and I've got some tinder that I've been collecting in the jungle. What I'm hoping is that this direct sunlight that we've got today, an advantage we didn't have last night, will allow us to reflect the sun's radiation into this and start this little bundle. Really want to get like a cigar size coal going if you can with this thing. Nice hot red coal. That's what we want. And I might have enough here to do this. There's no more sun anymore. And if we lose this fire, we're done. This is gonna be, this may be our only chance right here. This stuff is so wet, it didn't want to fire up at all. Friction fire, out of the question. Out of the question. What I want to 
hit on are these coconut palms. You know, I'm gonna need to knock those off and they're pretty tough up there. Some of the smaller green ones have more water and some of the larger ones have more food value. I'll look for a long piece of wood and just try to bump some off. Survival philosophy is to know how to improvise. And trash is a wealth of resources. Yeah, the amount of trash on this beach is unbelievable, man. This is definitely stuff that's washed up here. This is not stuff people are just coming by and throwing their trash on the beach. Glass containers would be a premium right now. Cordage would be a premium right now. A lot of times when you have trash on beaches like this, you have fishing ropes and nets and things like that have washed up. This is a really good bottle because it's got a really wide mouth on it. And it's not dirty on the inside. So this would be real good for boiling water. Dave! Dave! What do you got, man? It's an iguana right there. How big is he? He's about three feet long. He's right on this side. Oh, on this don't leaf spook here. him, man. Let me get something to catch him with, all right? Hang tight. Iguanas were a staple of the Mayan diet and are still considered a delicacy in parts of Central America. The best way to catch an iguana is when you catch him in a tree because he already thinks he's camouflaged up there and he's safe. If you try to chase him on the ground, you're not going to get close. What I'm looking for right now is anything that Cody and I can use. This is really good right here, this piece of cordage. I'm trying to make a quick noose here so we got something to catch him with. So I'm just going to unravel this rope two times here. One of them I'm going to try to make a noose out of real quick. Just a down and dirty slip knot, just like that. And the other one I'm going to use to tie the slip knot onto the rope. I gave up the snakes. We're not giving any more meat away. He's right on this side. What do you got? OK, take this pole. There's just a noose on here. Slide it around his head and just give it a freaking yank as hard as you can and yank him right out of the tree. You have your blade? I'll get it ready. Let me get over on that side. OK, hold on. Just be real easy, Cody. There you go. Now just lift it up there to him, Cody. And just fish it in there, you know what I mean? It's like you were fishing. And pull straight down and back once you get it around his neck. You got to get it around his neck, man. It's going to be hard to get this over his head. You're almost there, brother. Drop it down. No, 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 no. Just fish it in there, you know what I mean? It's like you were fishing. And pull straight down and back once you get it around his neck. Iguanas bite when startled and have 120 razor sharp teeth with serrated edges. You're almost there, brother. Good job, Cody. Drop it down. No, 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 no. You weren't there yet, Cody. You got to get it around his neck, man. Hang tight, man. Let me kind of walk you through it a little bit. I'll tell you when you got it around his neck. Keep going, keep going. Pull it back just a little bit, a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. Down, straight down. Good job, Cody. I just severed his spine. I can't believe he didn't see that noose coming. I catch a lot of lizards like that. If it's not a human being coming at them or a big object, they just kind of ignore it. Now we got some meat, brother. Hey, good job, man. Way to spot something to eat, brother. I never expected this. You know, I thought we would make, might get a few crabs out here, definitely some coconuts. That's why I was looking up. And then there's the iguana. There should be a lot of meat on here, and I'm really thankful to have it. You know, his skin in this guy, I had his guts in my hand, his head's on the sand, and he's still trying to claw me. Yeah, just nervous reaction. If you break the tail off one of these lizards, it'll lay on the ground and twitch for three or four hours. There you go. Hey, look. Unbelievable. You're not doing that? I'm not doing nothing, man. Hold it. Whoa. Iguana tails have evolved to automatize or fall off and wiggle during an attack. That's unbelievable. The tail continues to move to distract the predator and allow the lizard to escape. <laughs> I've never seen anything like that before. That big thigh muscle right off of there, man. Look at that. Look at that. Jeez. Look at that, dude. That is absolutely awesome. 
Mmm, bam. Huh? That's good. <laughs> Green iguana is a Belizean delicacy the locals call bamboo chicken. A full-grown iguana can be up to six feet long and have several pounds of protein-rich meat. My first grilled iguana is awesome meat. I mean, it's very tender, very sweet, very juicy, very chicken rabbit-esque. Survival experts live by a single word, prepare. So before setting off, bring everything you can. I'm gonna take this coconut and just beat the hell out of it on a hard surface from either end. And what that's doing is running shock waves up and down this coconut. And here's something that'll look more familiar to some people. It's on the grocery store shelves. And I'm gonna look for the little eyes here get a stick or something and try to jam it in one of those eyes. Usually there's one that's softer than the others. Whew. So there's some water value. Coconut water is isotonic, containing essential minerals like potassium that make it a more efficient electrolyte replacement than most sports drinks. I hope this isn't a laxative. There's actually a lot of water value in this. What do you want to do? We got that direction or that direction? It looks like the peninsula swings out. Maybe we walk down that way. If we get out on a point, maybe we'll be able to see both directions further down, you know what I mean? OK. In a survival situation, if there aren't any clues about where you're going, the best place is to get an open vantage point. And in this case, for us, it's peninsula. There's nearly 200 miles of coastline in Belize, much of it undeveloped. Cody and I made a decision today that we were going to go one way. And when you make a decision like that, especially when you do it as a team, then you commit yourself to that and you do it. Do you see that? That's either a boat or a house. All right. Good job, brother. Let's go. <laughs> Belize is a beautiful country, but I would not suggest wandering off into the wilderness by yourself. The jungle environment is very harsh if you don't know what you're doing. It could be a major problem for you to try to survive out here, but with the proper training, the proper knowledge, making intelligent, calculated decisions, it can be done. Anyone who would have gone through a situation like this, there's no guarantee. I don't give a damn what your training is or how badass you think you are. Mother Nature's always been the boss. <laughs> we made it, man. Agua Valley, southeastern Peru. In this lava-scorched rock desert, over 80 volcanoes have battered the already dry land, long deserted since the demise of the Inca hundreds of years ago. This unique past draws a handful of archaeologists and history buffs to this wasteland dubbed the Valley of the Volcanoes. But the desert is a brutal killer. Among the ancient ruins, a stalled car can mean the difference between life and death. People die in the desert all the time. It's not the real big thing that'll take you out. It's that the little teeny things of we forgot the water or we took the wrong turn, the spare tire is flat. Two of America's top survival experts, Dave Canterbury and Cody Lundin, will show what it takes to survive breaking down in one of the planet's driest deserts. Yeah, I'm looking around me right now. There's no water that I can see, no materials to build shelter that I can see. Anybody that came out here in this situation unprepared is going to die. Turn it over, see if it runs. 
See if it has an engine. Survival pros Dave Canterbury and Cody Lundin each bring their own brand of expertise to the table. It ain't going anywhere. But Dave is a woodland expert, and the Valley of the Volcanoes doesn't have a tree for miles. You know, I've got very little desert experience, nothing like this. I'm going to rely heavily on Cody this whole trip. Cody Lundin is the founder of an Aboriginal-style survival school. He teaches his students the hunter-gatherer skills critical to getting out of the desert alive. I have over 20 years plus of desert experience. I live in the high desert in Arizona. And if I take something for granted, I'm just as good as that corpse laying over there with no desert survival experience. Cocky people die in my profession. That's the way it is, or they should die. Looks like a freaking motorcycle. Wasn't made in Detroit. <laughs> This thing's a piece of crap. This is a 1976 Volkswagen Bug Coupe. Have some respect. In this desert survival scenario, Dave and Cody will assume two roles. The first, Dave will stay with the car to signal for rescue. If you believe that search and rescue is going to come and find you, then you should stay with the vehicle because that's going to be the biggest thing for them to spot. And the second, Cody will head out on a proactive self-rescue and search for life-saving water. Part of the reason Dave and I are doing this is to illustrate two different modes of desert survival. Stay put, and you have to go. You know, I'm about to do what I don't want to do, and that's the classic leave the vehicle. And as much as it breaks my heart, we both need to cannibalize this. The first rule of survival code, make the most of what you have. I don't give a damn what kind of car it is or how much you paid or your mother paid for it. Strip it. Get all the stuff out of it you possibly can. I need to have some sort of cordage I want to get a piece of that rubber spare. The seat covers can keep me warm at night, and they can also keep solar radiation off me during the day. There's shade. I've got a lot of wiring here, and I can use this wire for snares and building material. I've got a piece of tubing here that's used for siphoning gas. It can stretch enough to make an improvised slingshot type weapon with it. An automobile like this that's broke down is like a freaking supermarket. I'm going to grab this mirror off of here, Cody. You grab me one, too? Yeah, man. This one here looks like it unscrews. Probably have to break the other one out. If Dave doesn't attract a search team in 24 hours, he'll meet up with Cody to pull off a self-rescue together. 24 hours from now, if you haven't seen me, you might want to start flashing this thing every 15 minutes or something into the sun, so at least I know where you're at. OK. We need to divvy up this water, you know? OK. How much water do we have total? A gallon and a quart, maybe, at the most. So the bottom line is these are my recon bottles. So you Everything fill else those is yours. I don't drink much water, and I got shade all the time. I can sit my ass you under here. You need to start drinking water. In the heat of the desert, a healthy man can die of dehydration in less than three days. Every drop counts. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Back off. Hold that for me. Got it. Cody knows the value of water. Back home, he collects his own drinking and plumbing water from rain runoff. Every drop that hits the ground is one step closer to death. Mm. A lot of times in the desert where someone, usually a student, is not paying attention, you don't have a hold on that bottle, glug, 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 glug. it's all over the ground. I refuse to have that happen here. Dude, you're being so anal with this water, it's wearing me out. Arid environments pull water out of your body, even doing nothing. That's what they do. Hiking in the sun can burn as much as four liters of water per day. To make matters worse, the Valley of the Volcanoes spans from 8 to 12,000 feet above sea level. I have to take it real slow with the altitude, but I should be good to go. Altitude sickness starts to set in at 8,000 feet. You know what? I'm going to head for that freaking saddle, and I'll look for water on the way. The saddle is hard to miss. OK, man, I'll see you in 24 hours. OK. All right, brother. Good luck. Okay. All right, buddy. We'll see you. Cody faces a rough road ahead. An extreme naturalist, he hasn't worn shoes in over two decades. <sighs> Look at that thing. That's like the bane of my existence out here right now. I don't know what the hell this is, but you know, it's probably genus penis a whole lot. There's a saying in Mexico, only gringos and donkeys walk in the noonday sun, and here's your gringo. Heat causes perspiration. Even the smallest amount of body fluid lost in the desert can lead a person to dehydration. I'm not feeling too well. I'm just not totally 100%. Cody's took off now, off in the desert, and I'm here by myself. So I'm going to try to get a fire started to get a signal for rescue. Problem is, I can't find the freaking battery. 
If this is an American car, the battery would be right here. But then again, the engine wouldn't be in its ass either. Ha! Well, I'll tell you what. This is a dandy looking mattress right here. Ain't no Ford truck, that's for sure. Without matches or any combustion device, sparking a fire here will require some creativity. Now, I'm gonna try to get this wire so hot that it burns. An exposed metal wire can transfer heat to scraps of paper and start a fire. When I connect these two to my wire, I'm gonna create a direct short and a constant short. And this battery says right on it, you know, toxic and danger explosive. Then, attaching jumper cables to the wire will cross the positive and negative charges, creating a short circuit and a spark. Once I get this thing burning really good, I'm gonna to wanna to start throwing some green stuff on it to get smoke going. It's cloudy over here, and I don't have any threat right now of dehydration unless I just overexert myself. Cody, on the other hand, is heading toward that ridge, and it looks to me like there's clear weather there. But right now, he's getting beat by that sun. I need to shelter in fairly soon. I'm getting tired. Oh, boy. Oxygen levels drop at high elevation, asphyxiating the body's blood and tissue cells, causing drowsiness, weakness, and nausea. Constant exposure to the harsh sun compounds the body's weakened state. I just need a couple minutes of rest here because the sun has a cumulative effect. You know, I'm not feeling hot, and, uh, and it is hot. I'm, you know, weak, ache like a flu, <sighs> nausea. The combination of heat and altitude sickness can lead to vomiting and a life-threatening loss of body fluids. I teach survival skills for a living and I live in Arizona, so I've been a number of times in a desert situation not feeling good, not feeling myself with people that are counting on me. It sucks as anyone who's sick and tries to work knows. And I'm not just going to my cubicle in Chicago to do some typing. I have to be out here with the elements as well. Splitting up takes its toll. I should be seeing Cody's flashes by now. You know, we split up and we should have never done that. That's Never do that in a survival situation. Cody breaks down. I've been in a lot of situations where I've been low and short on water. It's a pretty intense experience. And Dave's dinner plans go up in flames. Here he is right here. You got him? Peru's Andagua Valley is dry, hot, and 12,000 feet above sea level. A recipe for altitude sickness and heat stroke. I blew chunks. I broke my heart, but I could not function with that vomit in my system. I'm losing water, so I'm already compromising the mission, so to speak. The deck is already stacked against me slash us in this scenario. Body fluids lost through vomiting should be replaced within hours. And when water is not available, rest and shade become critical. There's this little area here. If I can sneak back into these rocks, I might just call it a day. Uh, you know, it's been a, a challenging day. Uh, yeah, when you move in the desert, you lose water. You know, let alone being sick, so just feeling spent. You know, just spent. With no sign of a search team, it's time to find Cody. I don't want to haul that 20-pound battery around with me in the desert. So in a situation like this, you've got to have a contingency plan to make another fire. I need to work on some char cloth over here. Char cloth is a piece of fabric that's burned without oxygen, so it remains highly combustible. I have a piece of cotton material here that I pulled out of the back of this Volkswagen. This is more than enough for a couple different fires. So now all I really need to do here is 
get all the oxygen closed off from this piece of cloth inside here. And I can just set this right in these hot coals, just like this. Put this flat rock over it. The only thing I want to escape out of this now is gas. And what you have to do is basically superheat this without letting it catch fire. And basically, it carbonizes and becomes char cloth. And it will take a spark very easily that way. When charred correctly, the cloth will ignite with even the weakest of sparks. If you know how to improvise and adapt to the situation, and you can take a car and get everything you need off of it to keep you alive as best as possible. You know, even the little things like this. We've got this headlight, and now I've got a parabolic lens here that I can use to start a fire. I've also got a container here I can use to cook in because it's metal, or I can drink out of as a cup. When I think about stuff I'm going to carry, if I can't think of at least three uses for this, I'm not taking it with me. It's too much weight for what it's worth. You know, I have general fatigue, but I'm feeling a lot better than I did yesterday. I think whatever that was moved through me, I thank God. I have some downtime while I wait for Dave, but I'm gonna make use of that time. I need to make some sandals. <sighs> the last time I wore shoes, 22 years ago? Last time I wore sandals, probably within the last year. No, I don't care for wearing shoes, and there's multiple reasons why I go barefoot. And one of the reasons is it puts me in closer contact with Earth, forces me to slow down, so I pay attention to more stuff. It makes sense to me in my line of work with what I do. I try to live what I do, not just do what I do. Scientific studies have shown that people did have healthier feet before shoes were invented. But over 2,000 years of shoe wearing have left human feet vulnerable to the harshest elements. A lot of people's made entire sandals, the Taramahara, northern Mexico, there's a lot of people's that, because they were resource poor, used the rubber off spent tires to make shoes. This is the seat belt from our auto. So I'm cutting this to make straps for my sandals. So it's a pretty efficient, simple way to turn these tires into some footwear um, that's very low tech. But there's the finished product, so I think that'll work. There's a pretty nice piece of cactus up here to tie this bandana onto. Visibility, contrast, and movement are hallmarks of signaling for rescue. I do not want him walking past me. Dave and I agreed on about every 15 minutes, I would come out and flash the horizon. This might seem like an innocent little piece of car mirror, but this sucker's very potent from a distance. I'll just hold it back, and wherever I want it to be will be with the crotch of my fingers here, and know that a bit of that flash is going through my target area here, and I'll just hit it up on the horizon. And I need to pop in and get some shade. Cody should be flashing me. I should be seeing Cody's flashes by now. I'm getting up on some high ground now. We split up, and we should have never done that. That's you never do that in a survival situation. Dual survivals, art of self-reliance. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take this bottle here and use it for a portable transpiration device. Plants release water into the atmosphere in a process called transpiration. Sealing the foliage in a clear bottle traps the vapor, transforming it into potable water, one drop at a time. And I'm gonna hang this out on my back and hope that the sun leaches water out of these plants. Well, it won't provide me a lot, but it'll provide me some. In Peru's volcano-torn Andagua Valley, reuniting with a survival partner can take a flash of luck. Cody should be flashing me. I should be seeing Cody's flashes by now. Come on, son. Do me right. That's, that's got to be him. Come on, baby. Give me a signal. Ain't no other reflective source like that out here. I know a signal mirror. There. He's probably about a half mile out or so. Oh, yeah. There he is. I would cry 
when Dave came, but it, it would waste water. He'll just have to read the emotion of my feelings. Hola. Hola. Buenos dias, amigo. Es casa la Cody? Si. <laughs> There's not a lot of shade up here, but try to get some. Donde esta agua? You got some water, brother? A little bit here. When someone has to separate in a survival situation and they actually make it back together, it's an amazing feeling, you know, because it's a lot easier to try to do any sort of survival work in a pair than alone. Is that all the water you got? That's what I got. You can't get blood from a stone. You know, Cody's a desert survival expert, and even he couldn't find water. So for someone with inexperience in desert environments that can't find water, they're buzzard meat. The area may be a brutal desert, but it's at the bottom of a valley. Descending into it is the best bet, where runoff is more likely to collect. Nice Jerusalem cruisers, man. Yeah. When'd you make those? I made them this morning. They should work. Nice. What's that to keep your feet from getting stuck? Yeah. Ready? All right, man. I'm ready. Lead on, oh wise desert rat. Take a pee. Yeah, me too. You know what I say about this, man? I say <laughs> on the desert. That's what, I'm <laughs> That's what I'm saying to you. What color is your pee? Well, I can't tell because there ain't enough of it coming out. Producing less than a liter of urine a day is a clear sign of dehydration. Yeah, urine is the number one indicator I use in the desert. If your urine has any color to it whatsoever, it's your body's way of saying you need more water. So ultimately, I want my pee looking like the water I just drank. Mine's straw colored. Well, I didn't suppose it would be clear for either one of us, but you good? Damn, son. You know, what I have noticed is it does seem to be a little bit greener here. So that's a good sign, but it doesn't mean there's anything for us to procure as a human being. It's pretty to look at, whoopie do. Hey man, I'm hearing something. Can you hear that? Yeah, there's rocks coming down over there. No, 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 no. I hear something different than the rock. Hey, man, that's getting louder. You hearing that, Cody? Hey, man. Look at this, man. Look. I'll be damned. Look at that. I wish I had, like, a 400-foot straw right now. You know, Dave, in my country, this is just almost unheard of. I've been in a lot of situations where I've been low and short on water. I've been very, very thirsty and dehydrated. And what it's like to take water and put it up to your lips, it's, it's almost <laughs> It's a pretty intense experience. An active person can stay hydrated on less than a gallon of water a day. But the average American uses nearly 100, most of it, to flush the toilet. In my country, it's dry. I compost my own waste. I catch rain. I try to use water two or three times. And I see it wasted by my culture. And so when I see something like this, you realize what's truly needed for life, and all the drops away. Uh. Just because we found water doesn't mean that water's drinkable as is. River water can carry bacteria and pathogens that cause diarrhea and dehydration. If we go and drink this water four to six hours from now, we could both be spraying the rocks from our butthole. We're going to need to disinfect it for sure. I mean, I think that's the, the same thing to do. The best way to disinfect water in the wilderness is to get a fire going. What I have to do right now is give Cody his best chance of getting a sustainable fire. So my job is to make sure he's got plenty of kindling to do that with. His job is to get a flame. There's combustible energy in the char cloth Dave prepared back at the car. The slightest spark should ignite it. So the idea is to put a piece of smoldering char cloth under Dave's area here, blow it into flame, and hopefully we'll have fire. Now let's just go for it. Can you shield me from yep. this right over here? You got it. Cody's ignition trick. Create friction between the blade of a carbon steel knife 
and a piece of basalt rock. I've dropped it on there three times, and it's not quite catching yet. Uh oh, there it is. Uh, nope. Oh, man, Cody. We got well, about 20 minutes for another plan. I did bring one of the parabolic lenses off the headlight that we could try to play with in the sun, but we got about 20 minutes to worry about that. You know, okay. just let me get that ready because it'll take me a few minutes. Okay. Another uh, spark just dropped on it and it's going out. That shouldn't happen. So I'm not sure what's going on. I teach flint and steel. I've never seen a piece of char cloth not work. I'm hoping Dave has luck down there in the sunshine. It looks like we have maybe just 15 minutes of light left. The curved surface of the parabolic lens swiped from a headlight focuses the sun's rays into a single hot spot, ideally igniting the char cloth. But the angle of the sun has to be just right, and it's best at midday. Not getting the right angle. The sun's getting low in the sky, and I'm not getting the right angle here at all. Just not wanting to, not wanting to catch. Not getting the right angle. The sun's getting low in the sky, and I'm not getting the right angle here at all. Just not wanting to catch. In Peru's Valley of the Volcanoes, the ability to start a fire becomes the difference between drinking water and dehydration. I don't know what the variables are because I didn't make the char clock. I've I tried it and everything I possibly could, and is it too wet? I don't know. It's frustrating. You know, so he had the ignition. We're not gonna carry Go that ahead. battery. Yo! You ready? Yeah! I'm right here. I'm right here. Okay, let, let it go. Let's go. go. Get up out of the wind, man. Uh-uh. You want the wind blowing back to your back? OK. Here it comes. Okay, just don't move it. You're all right. Just a little bit at a time, go ahead. Nice, Dave. Nice, Dave. Oh, God. Relax, brother, you earned that one. Okay, yo, 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 we're in the desert. We're in the desert. What, what? We don't have that much fuel. Pull that thing off. It ain't going out. <laughs> okay. uh, it's time to sacrifice this bad boy to make a filter now. The first step to disinfecting water is to filter out any solids. Dirt and sediment particles can harbor viruses and bacteria. To uh, filter turbidity and things out of your water, it needs to be gradually heavy porous to less porous material. So your cotton bandana is what I use last. On top of that, I want to put some charcoal out of the fire. Then on top of that, I'll put a layer of real fine, silty sand and then more coarse gravel. You don't want to use something that you're going to drink out of because then the protozoa and stuff like that, microbacteria can still be on the rim. And I'll take a filled water bottle now and put it underneath here and fill it up, and then I'll take it over to the fire and we'll boil it. The second step, boil the filtered water for one to two minutes. Waterborne pathogens are best killed when heated to 212 degrees Fahrenheit. Here's the bottom line about disinfecting water in a situation like this. The incubation period of waterborne pathogens are a few days down the road. So if you're in a scenario like this, you want to try to disinfect the water, but for God's sake, drink the water anyway, because statistically you'll be found alive before that nasty stuff happens. You don't drink it, in this situation like this, you're dead anyway. How's it taste, man? It's a very fine vintage. Peru 2010. <laughs> Thanks for doing. I know it's a lot of work, but that keeps this is us from getting sick, doing. right? Yeah. What do you think for today, man? 
In a survival situation like this, you find water, you drink just short of throwing up. We drank like pigs. We have plenty of water. I want to make some time now while it's nice and cool. This is classic desert movement, Dave. We're going to follow the river and make as much time as we can as safely as possible. Towns tend to build up around water sources. The surest bet for rescue is to follow the river. I knew if that was an edible nut. Bert, it's pepper. Smell it. It is pepper. Yeah. Yeah, Peppercorn. Uh, you can absolutely smell it. I grab a few of those off of there, man. Our river is getting a little bit less, a lot bit less. The river seems to be diminishing very drastically as we go. Where I come from, you find a river, you follow it home. I'm starting to worry about that a little bit. This don't happen in Ohio, man. What is going on here? It just disappears. Hey, but to where? How can you have a river the size of the Colorado River just disappear? Unbelievable. It's like one big toilet. Wow. That sucks. In extremely dry land, porous rock and soil can suck water down into the earth like a sponge, turning a flowing river into buried groundwater. If I wasn't worried about the scenario, I would be amazed by it. Very least, before we go, we'll get our clothes wet. Wet clothing can lower core body temperature in the desert and reduce sweat loss. We got to get our clothes wet here. It's last water. I'm not going to get my pants and my boots wet and walk around this desert chafing my I'm wearing underwear. You're not, bro. You need to get your clothes wet, Dave. I'm doing what every desert rat does at last water. I'm getting in it. Yeah. I'm thermoregulating. We're not dehydrated now, and that's the point, is to not get dehydrated. It's almost like, oh, let me do. Yep, nipple check. There we are. I went from being a little bit warm to hard nipples in about four seconds. That's the power of water on my clothing via evaporation with the convective breeze blowing across it. Bam, bam, bam. Yeah. That's what I want to do, freeze in the freaking desert. Man, I'd love to say na 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 It doesn't feel good, but it does. You got all your gear? I got all my gear. Gear check, gear check. OK. All right. The river ending here is depressing. It's a huge buzzkill. It's like, what do you do, you know? You move on. If a river doesn't lead to rescue, the next best move is to go high. Right now, we're surrounded by canyon. We've got to get a high visibility point so that we can see where we're going. Hopefully, we'll get up on top of this ridge, and the village will be right there. When we're home free. That's my hope. Poop. Holy. That's not what I wanted to see. Oh, man, we're screwed now. Coming up, the guys get a rare shot at a desert meal. But the hunt threatens to go up in flames. Hurry up. Ah, oh, now I can't even see him. Face is getting out of control. Oh, That's not what I wanted to see. Are you kidding me? Look over here, man. There's a volcano right there. There's two volcanoes right there. This is all lava flow. That stuff went straight underground through this pumice. Lava rock covers nearly 40 miles of the Andagua Valley floor. Coming up over that ledge, you know, we have found acres and acres and acres of lava rock. It's very challenging terrain. It's a psychological blow, for sure. Now what? We go back into desert mode and just keep moving. I'll follow you, man. OK. The rock is sharp, unstable, and a recipe for injury. Crossing it demands concentration and slow footing. We have ass kicking train in Arizona, but this is the most punishing, long-term, heinous, godforsaken, sharp, brutal, hot, dry <laughs> that I've ever seen. The top priority in the desert is hydration. But trekking across rough terrain can burn as many as 5,000 calories a day. Oh, man. But if you go three days without food, I can guarantee you're going to be hating life. You're not going to be thinking straight. I don't care how much water you've got. Well, that feels a lot better on the ankles. 
Uh, where you going, brother? I'm gonna get a stick and gather some of these fruit. I've been seeing a lot of chona chona fruit, and those are the real big cactuses that almost look like the saguaros where I'm from. The Sancayo cactus in Peru produces a sour but edible fruit. Locals call it the chona. The other common name for these are devil You can see they kind of look like a scrotum from hell. It's not a very commonly used term, but here in Peru, it's actually used quite a bit. Devil or sack of Hades. Ah, son of So normally when you harvest them, they shouldn't fall on your bare foot. I'm pretty excited to have these fruit, and I'll tell you why. Most cactus fruit are around 85 to 90% water. The other 10 to 15% is glucose and fructose. So essentially what I have here is the ultimate electrolyte replacement drink, natural from the desert. So let me turn you on to a little delicacy here. You don't look too enthused. This ain't a vegetable. This is a small, furry animal. I seen you knocking the fur off of it a minute ago. Right. Those aren't spines, those it's fur. Look at that. Looks like diarrhea. You can just scoop the inside out. Chopstick. Mm. Mm. This chona chona cactus fruit is a lot like a kiwi. It's incredibly tart, but you can just see all the water value here. Oh, God. Dude, this ain't gonna get it for me. Well, I'm open for ideas. I'm gonna go back and go out and find a lizard, bop one of them in the head. Oh, you want me to get fire or just have it going? Yeah, I'll be back. Okay. This chair cloth Dave's had in his hat, it's pretty much dried out by now, so it'll be good to go. So I'll do a flint steel fire. I'm gonna go gather some firewood. Expert survivalists know how to do one thing best, improvise. I'm gonna try to build a flip, very similar to a slingshot. I cut a wide branch out of one of these old trees here. Got a piece of this siphon tubing that we got out of the vehicle and uh, got some wiring here that I'm using to wrap it with. Got a piece of this rubber that we used to make our funnel with. I'm gonna try to make a pocket out of that for a rock. I ain't eating that freaking cactus fruit, hippie juice, Cody drinks, ain't no way. Anything I see right now is me, it's fair game. Shh, shh, shh. Viscacha right there at 12 o'clock. The mountain viscacha is a rabbit-like rodent that thrives in rocky terrain. At three pounds, it's one of the best sources of meat in the valley. Oh. Viscacha can hear really, really good, so you gotta be real quiet to get close to them. You just gotta keep your eyes open for any movement. They're fast. Viscachas live in double-ended tunnels under the lava rock. Entrances are marked by piles of debris. He's right here. He's right here in this area. I see a hole here and a hole here. You see this? This is Viscacha scat. They poop before they go in, so I know this is the entrance. I'm gonna block the exit and the entrance so that he can't get out while I'm gone. Just wanna make sure that I tighten it up so he, he's not gonna squeeze through there. All right, time for me to go get Cody. Hey, Cody. What? Check this out, man. I got a viscacha. You still caught one? No. 
He's dead. He's trapped. I got him plugged up on both ends. Yeah, I read somewhere they smoke those things out here in Peru. Local Peruvians have long hunted bizcacha with fire, using the smoke to drive the animals from their den. What do you need for this fire to smoke this thing out of here? Why don't you take some fuel and prep it? I'll bring over a lit torch. If your smoking thing is going to work, let's do it now. I'm going to try to make a torch, so I'm going to bind up some dry material along with some green vegetation here, because green vegetation makes smoke, and that's the whole point of this. Go all the way to the bottom, Cody. Go all the way to the bottom, all the way down. Right here is the entrance to the hole, right where this rock is. I'm just waiting for you to tell me what to do. Not yet, man. I'm losing this torch here. Well, I got to get some, I got to get a bag set down here. He's going to run right through me. OK. We only got one shot at this. He comes running out of here. All right, Cody. Whenever you're ready, man, blow some smoke in there. The smoke should travel up through the Viscacha's tunnel, forcing the animal out the back and into Dave's bag. Any more green? Then the best way to kill it is to snap its neck. OK, I see him. He's in there. Keep blowing it, Cody. Keep blowing it in there, man. I see him. Stuff a full bundle up in there as far as you can get it. Run low into a lot of water, man. It's hotter than on this end. Okay, this is getting out of control for me. I got to right, back just off. Just suck, just suck. Can't even see him now. I can see him a minute ago. Now I can't even see him. I don't know where he went. Oh, here he is, right here. You got him. Okay, this is getting out of control for me. I got to right, back just off. Suck, a just suck, Cody. Can't even see him now. I don't know where he went. Oh, hey, here he is, right here. You got him. There he is. But I never expected the animal to walk down through and burst through a bunch of flaming sticks. And it was fairly easy to catch after that because it was pretty well stunned, like you can imagine. A lot of respect for that animal. So, man, I'm going to deal with this fire. There should be enough embers back there to get a fire to go in to process this out. Another team hunt, brother. Successful. That's right. OK, I'll be there as soon as I can. We're eating meat tonight. Yeah, that was pretty harsh. Not a way I would want to go, but you know, is, is any hunting? I think a lot more people would be vegetarians if they had to kill their own meat. Viscacha is prized game meat in Peru, but it's got to be prepared carefully and fast. They have glands in their tails, similar to how deer have in their hinds. If you don't get it cut off pretty quick, this meat's going to go taint. Any urine, musk, or intestinal fluids that seep into the meat can cause food poisoning, a potential death sentence in the desert. The easiest way to do one of these bad boys is just shuck him right out of his skin, just like a rabbit. You got to be very careful with this, not to get any of the innards cut while you're doing this, or you'll darn sure taint the meat. So you just want to kind of split them up the belly as best you can. Pull it all out, lungs, all that good stuff. Ooh. Except for that, heart, got to have that. The rest of it can go. Done deal. Split that rib cage just like that, ready for the fire. Hello. How you doing, man? I'm doing good. I saved the heart for us, brother. I knew you would. I'm going to get it cooking now. So take a piece of viscocha meat, add chona chona fruit, a little bit of skank water, David's peppercorns. Oh, you spoil me. I'm all for making things more comfortable. Survival sucks. I want to live. I don't want to survive. Well, the appetizer, the viscocha heart on parabolic lens. Hors d'oeuvres are served, sir. <laughs> the biggest piece is yours. Uh -huh. Is this a fine restaurant, or is this surviving in the desert? This is smoothing it, not roughing it. Mmm, mmm, boy. Is it bad? It was good. That slight kiwi snap of the chono chono, the rough yet subtle flavors of the peppercorns, <laughs> the light searing of the desert woods <laughs> on the viscacha flesh, all cumulate 
to make a delightful combination. It's really good, Dave. You know, our biggest priority in the desert is water, but the bottom line is you gotta have something to eat sooner or later. We want to get the hell out of the situation, and now we have a little bit of meat to give us the energy to push on even further. The priority for Dave and myself right now is to just get the hell out of here. We've had some rest, we've had some water, and we just want to keep booking it. The body burns through more water when it's digesting food. After a full meal, town better be right around the corner. The volcano blew its ass out out here. I mean, it's just the lava flow just... You want a high vantage point to scour for signs of civilization and the most direct route there. I see a roof. I see it too. I don't think that's a mirage, brother. I think this is it. End <laughs> of the line. Let's find the path to least resistance and drift on in. Well, we made it through one more, huh? Hell yes. Following you, co chiefs. Okay. My words of wisdom for a desert survival situation is get some training for arid regions. Always go prepared. Always leave a game plan with people back in town. And water, water, water. What do you think about those terraces over there, Cody? Inca, free Inca, maybe? A lot of work, man. That's amazing, isn't it? You have to understand the key elements of starting a fire, for navigation, for signaling. If you understand all those things, you're well ahead of the game. The more you know, the less you need, but don't take the desert for granted or she'll kick your ass. Can you read that, man? It means we're done. It means we're done? <laughs>